Hey man, thanks for thanks for doing this. This is great. I mean, this all came about because we I talked to Darren Paltrowitz, his DLR book, and you were watching the interview, and you're thinking, I got a lot more stories to tell. So that's what brought us here. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I've had a connection to uh, the website for a long time, and originally, you know, the website stemmed out of the Van Halen Insider magazine, which I used to write for back in the day. You know, uh, so I've just always kind of been enough of a super fan that uh, not only am I a fan and I have my own music career, but um, I'm the guy, you know, going to the websites every day and reading this stuff because I'm just an Eddie freak and a DLR freak, and I was lucky enough to have this uh, kind of series of events that got me weaving in and out of the Van Halen story sort of throughout my life. And I've told little pieces of this, but I've never really sat down and kind of just given it all, like here's sort of what happened. So I figured this was the time to do it. <laughs> yeah, and you gave me a great outline beforehand. You sent me an email with all the stories and man, you know, all the stories going back to the eighties before we get into them, just the background for people that may not be fam familiar with you, where you're from, how did you enter this whole world of Dave and Van Halen, et cetera? Cause you, you'd, you'd sure. have a connection to the Zappas and Stevie Vai as well. Yeah. I mean, essentially, I, you know, much like everyone else, I think uh, the way I got into Van Halen's music was, you know, I, I loved listening to the radio. I loved rock and roll. I was a big fan of in the early 80s when I was like, you know, 12 and 11 and stuff of, you know, just the rock and roll that was on the radio. So Joan Jett and the Go-Go's and Tony Basil and the Knack. And uh, but I remember one night hearing Jim Ladd on KLOS at midnight on a Sunday. It was a just passed away. Moment. Yeah. Rest just peace. passed away. Yeah. Um, he played the new Pretty Woman single before Diver Down was out. And it was like, hey, we're premiering the new Van Halen single. And I kind of knew the name Van Halen. I was not really aware of, I wasn't necessarily interested in guitar yet, but I heard that song come out of the radio and it just, I just was like, whoa, I've never heard anything like that. And I literally went out and got a guitar the next day and started playing and it literally changed, you know, the entire course of my life in that one moment. So I was a Van Halen freak, but when we were kids, even before that, my brother and I went to school uh, in the Valley at this grade school where the Zappas went and I started there in second grade and I remember Moon and Amit. I didn't know Dweezil at that point, but I knew them just as kids that we were running around the schoolyard with, you know, Moon was a little older. Amit was a little younger, but um, I knew them. Valley Girl was out. So Moon was already kind of famous, but, you know, we were all young enough that I don't think anyone really cared. It was like, oh yeah, that girl's got that single, you know, whatever. Um, but so that just for the timeline, it's like the early 80s, Valley Girls just come out. And, and what um, school, by the way, Frank? What school? It was, was called it? the Country School. And then a bunch of us that went, including the Zappas that went to the Country School, went to when you graduated from there, we went to Oakwood. And Oakwood had a lower school, which was like the grade school, and then a junior high and high school. So you could go to Oakwood from kindergarten all the way through 12th grade and graduate. I didn't. But um I think I think that when I met the Zappas, Amit and Moon, they were at country school. And I think Dweezil might have been at Lower Oakwood at that time. I could be wrong about that. But and this was all the Hollywood area. This was all the North Valley, Hollywood? San Fernando Valley, sort of Studio City, North Hollywood area. And so, of course, you also know that at this time, Eddie's living on Coldwater Canyon. So, you know, Eddie's not all those guys were, you know, floating around Pasadena in the Valley and Hollywood and stuff. So. Um, now again, I didn't know Dweezil yet, uh, but at that point, um, I knew those kids and then I got into Van Halen and at some point I read in one of the guitar magazines that, uh, Eddie had produced this single, My Mother's a Space Cadet, uh, for Dweezil. And I went out and got the single simply because Eddie was involved. And also because at that point, Dweezil was only like a year older than me or a year and a half older than me. So like the idea that this kid my age was like making records with Van Halen and was related to these other kids I knew from my grade school. That was the other thing is I didn't know Dweezil, but I was like, wait a second, that's Ahmed's brother. You know what I mean? So in seventh grade, when I started at Oakwood, um, I was riding bikes. We lived in the Hollywood Hills, so we would ride up a mall and drive our BMX bikes like totally insane. Now I'd never let my daughter do that when she was at age because there's just wild drivers, just you know, murdering people on the road. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, we would ride our bikes around there, and I knew this kid named Tristan Taylor, and Tristan was like, "Hey man, we should go over to my friend Amit's house 
he's got a really wild house over there. And I was like, uh, I know that Amit kid. So we drove our, you know, rode our bikes up there and buzzed the buzzer and Amit let us in and we're hanging out and in walks Dweezil at some point. And now Dweezil's kind of on my radar. So first thing I'd say to him is like, hey, didn't you record with Eddie Van Halen? He's like, yep. And he kind of told me the whole story. And I'll fill you in on a little bit of that in a second. Um, and then he pulled out like a guitar that Eddie had given him, like a striped crazy ass guitar. You've probably seen that recently he pulled it out on some social media videos. I'm Dweezil Zappa, and this is the guitar Edward Van Halen gave me when I was 12 years old. I'm going to try to play a rupture on it. <laughs> But and he's like playing Van Halen licks note for note and then hands me the guitar. And I'm just like, I mean, I could play a little bit at this point. I had, you know, I could do my couple little Chuck Berry licks. And, you know, I was just learning. I could play Malaguena, you know, the Spanish thing on guitar. And essentially, I think that Dweezil kind of liked me because I was a fellow Van Halen freak and I was interested in guitar. But he but I, I don't think that, he, that my guitar playing was passing the uh, test. So he took it upon himself to essentially teach me how to pe become a better guitar player. And I think a lot of it was just like, if this kid's going to hang around, he's got to step his game up. So he actually wrote, and I still have it. I should have actually pulled this out, but uh, uh, he wrote for me a hand-drawn how to play guitar manual with all the scales and all the chords written by Dweezil with drawings and stuff in between because he was a really good artist. And that's really how I went from being kind of like a dorky beginner player to like actually becoming a good guitar player is that Dweezil decided I needed to be. If and you still have so. that, man, send it over. I'd love to take it I over. Do ha I definitely natural. have it. I don't exactly know where, but I have a storage space in our garage and, you know, I'm sure I could figure it out. Um, now, but I Frank do, Zappa I now, his dad was his dad around because this all this yes. comes comes into play because Frank is friends with Eddie. All, right. That's how so, all of this is coming about. Right. So Frank when he wasn't on tour was always around the house and you know i had peanut butter sandwiches with him i had <laughs> coffee with him you know they would tell you all he would eat was peanut butter sandwiches drink coffee and smoke cigarettes and i did all three of those with him at some point i was in the studio utility muffin research kitchen constantly dweezil and i recorded demos of our band we had at one point in there me and him and scott tunis from zappa's band and donovan leach uh had a band called Gruen with that River Phoenix was briefly in wow. and we, we recorded down in Zappa studio and I got to watch Zappa record. And I, uh, that's how I met Steve Vai. Steve Vai was around a lot then. So, you know, I've told you the story and let, don't let me forget to go back to the, my mother's a space cadet. Cause there's a yeah, few yeah. tidbits. I know, I'm just curious. Day. What was Frank like off stage in Frank person? Frank was, Frank was really, really cool. And what I always liked about Frank is that he talked to you like you were an adult. So I was a little kid when I met him, probably 12 years old, and he would just talk to you about whatever the news of the song that was playing on the radio. Do you want a peanut butter sandwich? You know, like he was very, very approachable and very cool, but he kept weird hours. You know, he was never awake during the day, so you can only catch him at night or maybe if I was there early in the morning, he might still be up. But basically he was in the recording studio constantly. He had a guy named Bob Stone that was his engineer. And Bob seemed to just live at the house from what I could tell for months at a time. And Frank Don't call 24 seven <laughs> pretty much. Yeah. And so around then, you know, Steve Vai was around. Scott Tunis was around a lot. Chad Wackerman, uh, a lot of Zappa's band guys were floating in and out of the studio and the, you know, Dweezil was family. So if I was hanging with Dweezil, you know, suddenly I was like with the family and doing all this, this crazy stuff like i have told you the story about you know dweezil picking me up with steve Vai in his car and playing me rough mixes of eat him and smile before anyone even knew that they had a band or anything um i also remember when there's a famous guitar that dweezil has uh that's got madonna's true blue cover on it and when it came in from charvel dweezil and I grabbed the case from the mailman and Frank and Steve were in the studio recording and he called them out. And we all sat around as he unboxed the video and tuned it up and then played it. And then he handed it to his dad and his dad started playing some shredding licks. And then he handed it to Steve Vai, who starts doing his crazy shit. And then Steve hands it to me. And I'm like, 
<laughs> you know, like by by two little like Johnny Thunders licks that I knew, you know, and uh, but those guys were all way cool. And, you know, I think they again, they just liked that I was like enthusiastic and I love guitar and I sort of, you know, appreciated all this music. And that's art awesome. It. I'll also Space tell you that Cadet they had single a... you said you wanted them. Let's not forget the Space Cadet single. Yeah. So, the, I mean, I wasn't there for that, but a couple interesting things. So the band for that were all kids from Oakwood and all kids I went to high school with because Dweezil ended up leaving Oakwood, but the rest of the band stayed. So the bass player is Scott Marshall, and he is the kid of uh, the son of Gary Marshall, the famous TV director and producer, oh, yeah. creator of Happy Days. So the bass player was Scott Marshall. Yeah, the singer besides Moon was Chris Peters, son of John Peters, who is the produ- super famous Hollywood producer that the movie Shampoo was based on, and Warren Beatty plays. John Peters in the movie Shampoo wow. and John Peters married Leslie Ann Warren, the actress and Chris Peters, the singer of the Zappa Dweezil's band was their son, Chris. There was a guy named Tucker Tooley, who I remember just from high school, but he was also, uh, I think he was the drummer and then Moon was on vocals and Dweezil on guitar. And they basically were the band on it. I mean, there might've been some editing and some fixing because they were all teenagers and stuff, but here's the interesting thing. So it's listed as the Vards is the producer. And that is Zappa and Eddie. Zappa and Eddie, Frank Zappa and Eddie produced that song together. It's the only known collaboration between them. And Dweezil told me that that's Eddie playing the riff and the rhythm guitar. So that whole riff, when you listen to it now that I've told you that, you're going to listen and go, of course it's Eddie. And the reason is that Dweezil was self-taught. He didn't even get taught by his dad. He just had the talent in the bloodstream, you know, that his dad, from his dad, obviously. But Dweezil sat down. He told me this, you know, I think the first day I met him. He sat down the first day he ever picked up the guitar and figured out Eruption. Think about that. Mm. I've been playing guitar for 40 years. I can't play Eruption note for note. It's just, you know, I'm not saying people can't. I'm not saying I'm the greatest guitar player. But, like, I'm a professional guitar player. That is a very difficult piece of music. To pick that up, on your first time on the instrument is yeah unheard of yeah uh still to me to this day i really in terms of sheer ability dweezil at 12 years old is probably a better guitar player than me and anyone i know right now as seasoned as we all are dweezil had such a natural ability from the second he picked it up and he was also a killer baseball player dweezil probably really? would have Dweezil would have easily gone on to become a professional baseball pitcher. He was killer. He's also a killer hitter, but that guy was an all around athlete and could have easily gone pro and was being poised to go pro by any coach he worked with until much like me, you know, he, until he heard it, Van Halen on the radio and dropped everything forever, except for playing guitar. And so uh, he then put all that energy and focus, but he obviously had a natural ability. So, what Dweezil could do is that he could shred. He could tap and play crazy licks and all that advanced stuff. But what he couldn't do is play rhythm guitar and he couldn't keep a beat. So he could play it, but none of it was on time. And, you know, he could do all that stuff, but he wasn't like, didn't know how to tap his foot and put it in time. And he certainly couldn't play a steady rhythm guitar part. So from what I understand, Eddie is the rhythm guitar player on that. And then Dweezil's leads were basically, Dweezil just shredded and Frank edited those leads to what you hear. Because as you know, Frank's whole recording technique back then is he would take, he would float solos from live shows into studio tracks or remove the audience and turn a live show into a you know live song into a studio track. And then sometimes he would take like a solo in E and fly it into a song in B or something purposely to get like, you know, different notes and a different approach. And uh, always still within the realm of being in key and stuff, but like, but like, you know, he was transposing solos and stuff and flying in stuff. Doing what a mind he had for sure. So when you think about, you know, he's got this kid that can like, all right, Dweezil, go. But like, it doesn't make any sense and it's not a song. So, you know, I think the band and Dweezil and maybe with the little help from Eddie came up with these song ideas, Crunchy Water, which is a great song. And my mother's face got a great song, great pop songs. But 
from what I understand, Eddie's playing the rhythm and Dweezil's doing the leads, at least on Space Cadet. I don't know if he specifically told me that about Crunchy Water. Crunchy Water is also a way easier riff. So I can kind of imagine that they maybe he could play that once or twice and Frank could just edit it. But Frank was doing cutting and pasting before digital technology. And that's sort of an interesting thing about him. So I'm wild guessing that there's a lot of elements to those right. songs sounding as good as they do, that Frank was such a great producer and editor and just sort of took this teenage band and made them sound like pros, you know? When you mentioned Vard, I know the story behind that. That has to do with Eddie's mom, Vard. Oh, that's what the, uh, yeah, that's what the, the the word is, right? Because, yeah, his, mo his mother used to say, Ed Vard. Right, right, right. So yeah. it became Vards. That's the, Vard, the story yeah. behind it. Yeah, and that, and that's essentially the tip of the hat that Eddie's behind. I'm pretty this sure. Whole thing. Pretty sure but that's the story. I'm yeah. also no. I'm I'm sure you're right about that. But the I think what Vards essentially means is yeah, it's, it's Eddie. But I mean, whether it meant that or not, I mean, the reality is it was in Frank's studio. Frank was at the sessions. Frank edited the sessions. Like I think basically, you know, those two adults, both geniuses you know, made a record with uh, Frank's teenage son's band. And that's what you hear. And that's why it sounds so great, because how's it not going to sound great and have killer guitar with Eddie Van Halen and Frank right. Zappa producing, you know? Yeah. And let's get to the Edom and Smile story, because we did talk, we touched on this because you did tell Darren Paltrowitz and it's in his book, the DLR book, but talk yeah, a little bit more, because I'm curious what, what the songs were, because I think it was this, Yankee Rose. I think it was, I think Darren said it was Tobacco Road, but it, tell it, us it this was, whole story, how this comes about yeah it was both those songs those were the two he played me they he, they might have played more i actually think he might have played me ladies night in buffalo too um but for sure those two in fact i'm pretty positive he played me ladies night in buffalo or at least an element of it um right. what it was is that uh at that time uh, I used to go over to the Zappas pretty constantly and Dweezil was a little older than me, so he could drive at this point. So I couldn't drive. So a lot of times if I was going to go to Dweezil's house, I'd ride my bike because it was not that far. Uh, or he would come pick me up or my parents would drop me off. My And my mom and Gail became good friends. And my mom, believe it or not, the Zappas were uh, members of a tennis club. Uh, and not because they even them played tennis, but because they had a pool and then, you know, like stuff for the kids to do and you know, rack not rack, but you know, tennis courts and and like walls to play handball on and stuff like that. And uh, and so we kid my mom introduced Gail to this thing and she got them a membership so that basically one of our two moms could take all of us kids and we could go like burn off a Saturday or Sunday, you know, doing that. Um but anyway, so uh, <clears throat> once Dweezil could drive, he would just call me up sometimes on a on a Saturday morning or whatever and be like, hey, man, I'm coming to pick you up. And, All right, cool. And he'd pick me up and I'd go back to the house or maybe we'd go see a movie or maybe we'd go into the valley to this place called Humphrey's Yogurt, which was like our favorite yogurt spot. And uh, and so one day he just showed up with Steve in the car. And I think I'd, I'm pretty sure I'd seen or met Steve at that point, but I certainly... It was a surprise because at this point, oh, I, I know I for sure had met him because we went and saw. Oh, here's another. Well, let me finish this and then don't let me forget the other right. thing I'm about to tell you about Steve Vai at the Country Club. That's what you got. Okay. Uh, Steve uh, Vai at the Country of, Club. Uh, the Flexible Tour. Really interesting story about that. Um, he just rolls up with Steve in the car. And this is after Steve was in Alcatraz and obviously Zappa. Now he's in David Lee Ross band. We might have heard the rumor. I mean, maybe I even knew through Dweezil that Steve was in the band, but certainly no one had heard any music. There wasn't an album release date. You know what I mean? Like, like whatever they were doing was secretive at this point. So he rolls up with Steve and I get in the car and I'm kind of trying to play it cool, but it's like, oh man, it's just Steve Vai's in the, in the, in the car. And he goes, hey, Frank, yeah, man, uh, Steve's playing me this new stuff he's working on with David Lee Roth. And I'm like, what the? And he pops in Tobacco Road immediately. And I just was like, wow, this is insane. I'm pretty sure it was rough mixes, too. I don't think the record was even done yet. Then we he played me Yankee Rose. And then he played me, I think, a little bit of Ladies Night in Buffalo by the time we pulled into his... Uh, his parking lot. And Steve was always super, super cool and was super cool at that moment. And Steve wasn't a huge rock star yet. You know what I mean? Like this rock album hadn't come out. Alcatraz were not that big when he was in the band. Uh, and he was, while Zappa was big at that point, you know, Steve wasn't known outside of like Zappa nerds and guitar nerds, really. 
Uh, so going back to the, so anyway, so I heard this stuff and it sounded great. And then I, I don't really remember what we did for the rest of the day. Well, that might've, that might've been the same day that the Char, in fact, it probably was the same day that the Charvel with Madonna, you know, the Charvel Jackson with Madonna showed up and that's probably why Steve was there, you know? Okay. I mean? Well, Eat and Smell come up, comes out on July 7th of 86. Do you know so when this, this would have been? Uh, No. I mean, I would have, I would have imagined, well, let me, I mean, I would imagine it was just earlier in 86, you know, cause back then, you know, they made the record over a few months. It was probably coming out six months later or something. You know what I mean? So I don't know. I'm not, right. I, I, really, I don't really know, but whenever, whenever the, well, put it this way, it's probably whenever they were mixing the album, because I'm pretty sure what he was playing, me were like bored rough mixes. So um, I'm on a wild guess. He had a cassette that he took home from some mixes like the previous night or something. And that's what I was hearing. So whenever wow. they were you know, wow. mixing the record, whenever that timeline. And is. I got to sneak in a story, a small world story before you continue. Alcatraz, Gary Shea, the bassist. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about small world. Grew up literally a stone's throw from where I live here in no Southington, way. Connecticut. That's funny. And I wrote an article about him for a Connecticut radio station. He found out about it, sent me a thank you on Facebook. And I... I heard him on the Kiss podcast, Three Sides of the Coin, saying he's from Connecticut. That's how I discovered him. And his website said Southington, Connecticut. I was like, mind no blown. You know, this is in the, we're in the middle of, you know, right in the middle of Connecticut between New Haven and Hartford. He said, yeah. yeah, I grew up on Liberty Street. Now, Liberty Street is right across the street from my, my doctor since I was a kid. I mean, like, literally right near the elementary school. I'm like, this is crazy. That is hilarious. What so, a small world. Yeah. Gary, if you're watching this, what's up? All right. Well, so the other, just a quick sidebar, real quick, yeah. with Steve. And let's not forget the Stevie story you said about. Is this no. something you're going to get into? Well, yeah, yeah. This is what I was going to say. So, um, so I did because Steve was in the Zappa family. You know, I he, he was around for 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 things and stuff. And I saw Zappa play a bunch of times. I saw the Zappa rehearse a bunch of times. And I was in the studio when he was working a lot. And Steve was just always kind of around. Um, and so. Steve put out a record called Flexible that I think it might have even come out when he was still in Zappa's band. But that record came out and he did a handful of shows for it. And one of them is was at the Country Club in Reseda, uh, California. And um, it was a club where later I saw like Poison and Warrant and Guns N' Roses and all those bands when they were unsigned, like local bands. And you'll see where I'm going with this. So there's a bunch of. And I'm such an inexperienced concert goer at this point. The only time that I'd gone to concerts is when my parents would take me to concerts. So Dweezil says, hey, man, I'm playing. I'm going to sit in with Steve I tonight at the country club. Um, do you uh, do you want to come down? I'll put you on the list. I'm like, yeah. And I asked my parents and they're like, no, like, well, you can go, but we're not <laughs> going to take you. So I asked my friend's mom and she was a Zappa fan. I was kind of like, oh yeah, sure. I'll take you guys to go see Zappa's guitar player and, and Zappa's kids. So my friend Mariah and his mom, Anita, uh, took me down and Dweezil told us, you know, like shows at eight. And I just thought that meant like Steve Vai's on at eight, you know, shows at eight. We show up at eight. And of course there's three no name opening bands on before Steve Vai ever hits the stage at 11. So we see all of them. The very first band that played that night was called Rapid Fire and they played to nobody and like to us and probably their friends and moms or whatever. And it was the first time that I'd ever seen a band or a musician even besides Dweezil that was like kind of my age. I mean, I was, you know, probably 14 or 15, but these guys were all looked like they were like 19 or 20. You know what I mean? Like I was like, oh, I mean, whoa, these guys are up there doing it. You know what I mean? And they sounded great. And I remember they had this song. I can still remember to this day called... Uh, rumble and it went like you know the high pitched singer. And I was just like, oh man, a rumble. I you know I love movies like The Warriors and Wanderers, and I was just like, oh I love this. So I go up to the red haired skinny singer after the show, and I go, oh your band's great, and I ask for his autograph, and he literally looks at me and goes, why? And I go, well because your band's awesome, and uh, I think you're great. And he was like, all right, and he signed it. I don't. I wish I'd kept it. I didn't. Um, but I did get this guy's autograph. So now, and I always remembered the band and the show and everything, but you know, they didn't go on to any fame or anything. Now, many years later, it's like 99, 2000. Uh, and I'm at knac.com. I was the managing editor of knac.com, this sort of online heavy metal radio station that had spurned out of a actual uh, radio station in LA. And, um, I get a press release from Cleopatra records and it says, 
Axl Rose's pre-Guns N' Roses, pre-Hollywood Rose, pre-Rose Band, Rapid Fire Collection of the Demos Never Before Heard, with a bio essentially saying that right when he got off the bus, he answered a recycler ad, and before he ever found his way to Tracy Guns and Izzy Stradlin and that crew, he just joined a metal band. And that metal band was Rapid Fire. And they only played four or five shows. And that is the first band I ever saw was a teenage or just out of his teens actual. And I got his autograph, which is, I'm wild guessing, the first, based on his reaction, the first time anyone ever asked for his autograph. And I would not, he would not have signed it Axel. He wasn't actually yet. He would have signed it Bill Bailey or William yeah. Bailey, which is probably why 10 years later, I was like, the fuck do I have this Bill Bailey's autograph for? <laughs> you know what I mean? Because yeah. it wasn't until I read that press release that I went, that guy was Axel. Wow. What that and autograph I went and would saw, be worth. And I, and I saw Guns N' Roses multiple times as an unsigned band after that and never put it together until that moment. I love that story. You told that story to me on my podcast, Booked on Rock, and I had yeah. to isolate that for a video because it's just such a wild story. But wild how, much, story. how much that autograph would be worth right now? I know. Oh and then I God. also saw Steve at the country club with uh, Alcatraz on the Disturbing the Peace tour. Uh, Dweezil and I and Moon went to that. Anyway, so... Skipping kind of ahead, uh, I'll just tell you a couple other random tidbits of the 80s before we jump into the 90s, which sure. is Dweezil took me to see Van Halen at the Forum on the 5150 tour. Bachman Turner Overdrive was opening and we had amazing seats because it was Dweezil and he knew Eddie. And afterwards, we went to the Hard Rock Cafe where they were having an after party. And that was the first time that I met Eddie Van Halen. So uh, and at that point, you know, they'd switch singers. Hagar was in the band. But I, you know, and I'm a David Lee Roth guy in general in terms of those records. I like Hagar a lot. I love Montrose and stuff. But at that time, you know, I was, I mean, I was a hundred percent. Like it was fucking Eddie Van Halen. You know what I mean? Like, okay, Roth was out of the band. I loved Eat Him and Smile too, but I was on board for 5150 and everything that Eddie was doing at that point, he could do no wrong in my eyes whatsoever. So I got to meet him uh, on the 5150 after party tour. I met him a few times afterwards, but that was for me at the time being a teenager was like a magical special moment. Um, and then, I mean, I, I guess that's kind of it, except that I, I'll tell you that uh, as far as the 80s era goes, is that uh, Eddie had given Dweezil at least one guitar, but Dweezil also had a bunch of guitars that he had he had painted or put stickers and stripes on like Eddie. So around Dweezil's place, there were all sorts of Eddie Van Halen looking guitars, one of which was given him, to him by Eddie. But at one point, uh, Eddie or Dweezil gave me one of his guitars that he had turned into an Eddie Van Halen. It was an Araya, it's a Japanese Araya or area, and it's uh, got a floating Floyd Road rose uh, whammy bar with the you know the with the back dug out so you can get all those crazy harmonics it's got the locking system it's done up to be an eddie guitar dweezil even put the stripes on it everything and then gave it to me i still have it i'm sure um, people are curious too what was eddie like when you first met him did he talk a lot with you was he uh it was a party was you know what i mean you know, hey man I, what's yeah, up cool. yeah that was exactly i mean i, I remember going at you hey man you gave me kind of a bro -y hug but like you know he was surrounded it was the hard rock cafe it was packed yep. uh i remember valerie was next to him i remember the band was sitting around but honestly as much as they were all huge rock stars, like my was laser focused on it on Eddie. yeah uh, yeah. And so, but I wouldn't say I couldn't even really tell you what he was like because I was so starstruck, and and it was yeah. it was a party, you know. He was, I'm sure he was, you know, tossing down drinks. But anyway, so then it's cut into the '90s. At this point, you know, Dweezil and I stayed friends, uh, and we even at one point started a little funny side project band called Dan Halen, where we were writing sort of, I wouldn't say parody songs. They were kind of like Van Halen tribute songs. Like we had a song called look at all the people here tonight. And it was like, we took all of Dave's kind of fun stuff that he would say on stage and made them into lyrics. And, and he wrote, Dweezil wrote this incredible Van Halen esque riff. And we went into, you know, utility muffin research kitchen and recorded all that stuff. Um, just demos, but uh, and Dweezil was really good with programming drum machines and all that stuff, you know, early on. And we both had cassette four tracks. And so we were doing all sorts of goofy stuff like that. But uh, so we were doing the Dan Halen thing. And then and, and you know, I was still in his universe. And I say that only because, you know, at some point we both had kids and grew up and, you know, start, you're not like palling around with people quite the way you are when you're a teenager in your 20s. But this is still all during that era. And Dave 
now I'm just, this is sort of a, a, a funny story, which is so Dave announced doing those Vegas shows, you know, with the Mamba Orchestra and the blues busting Mamba Orchestra. So I went to both of those shows, meaning he did two runs residencies, one at Bally's and one at the MGM Grand. 1995. I to, yeah, I went to both shows, uh, meaning a Bally show and a, a MGM Grand show. My friend Scott Chernoff and I went and um, they were both incredible and absolutely amazing train wrecky but amazing like dave was not at his best vocally uh the whole idea was sort of ill-fated but of course it made perfect sense because dave had the personality and you could see the vegas in him of course but it wasn't like the most well executed um you know concert experience that being said you know look man i i i'm a big b movie fan like i like b movies better than a movies so for me as a day fan as a van Halen fan, i was in hog heaven i was like this is where he's meant to be this is incredible you know like you could make arguments how he's not quite hitting the notes i was like doesn't matter doesn't matter this is yeah this is, i hear what you're saying i, I was just like so, i yeah, am so. i didn't see that show when he came around to connecticut just for people who may not know he wasn't playing he wasn't playing the songs like, uh, you know, like like in the style of rock, but with a little bit of a Vegas edge. I mean, he was reworking all the songs, right? There was like well, grass and, section, I and think. And he wasn't was... even doing a lot of Van Halen songs. Right. Maybe three. I mean, mainly it was like he was doing Teddy Pendergrass and yes. Steely, Steely Dan, Back to My Old School, Love TKO by Teddy Pendergrass. He was James doing Brown, James, Living in yeah, America. Not even, a, not even a cool James Brown song. Living in America is right, like the right. worst James Brown song. You know, I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a great song, but in the world of James Brown songs, my God. Right. Um, yeah, so he, it was like a lot of 70s covers and slow jams. Uh, free Ride, he had Edgar Winter in his band, so they would do Frankenstein and Free Ride and stuff. And um, it was great, but it was, you know, cringy at times, but it was it was great. I loved it. So what I didn't know is that seeing that show and the review I wrote about it in a fanzine, that's really kind of what introduced me and Dave and began our little odyssey, if you call it that. Um, I was writing for a fanzine that my friend Lindsay Parker, who went to me to, I think it was the MGM Grand Show, uh, and I would write for her fanzine. And also at this point, you know, I was writing for... Uh, or maybe a little bit later, I was writing for the Star Wars Insider, which was the Star Wars magazine. Then later, I was writing for Van Halen Insider. I was writing for LA Weekly, New Times, Billboard, Variety. I was doing a lot of freelance journalism at this time. And this is in the era of the fanzines, you know, these like indie punk rocky fanzines. So I would write for them. Me and Lindsay went and saw the show <clears throat> and I wrote a review of it and essentially said what I told you just now. But probably leaning a little bit more on the, it was the greatest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was basically a glowing review of a concert that was getting panned across the United States. No one was giving him good reviews. He went on Jay Leno and it was a train wreck. Robin Williams made fun of him on, day, on, on Jay Leno. Um, and not in a cool, like, I can't believe Robin. It was in like a, oh my God. Um, yeah, so I've seen were, it. Things were not going well for Dave at this point. And, but I was a hundred percent in his corner and I loved the show. And that's essentially what I said. And it was sincere. So, it wasn't like you were just, no, you, know, absolutely. Blown smoke you didn't no, even know he was, was going to read it. Nope. Nope. Of course I didn't think he was going to read it. It was a fanzine. It wasn't even in, right. I like at this time I wrote for some bigger magazines. This was not that. This was a tiny fanzine that you'd get for free at like a Silver Lake hipster band concert or something. Um, so I get a call. I don't remember how he tracked me down, but I get a call from Eddie Anderson. And Eddie Anderson was Dave's former bodyguard in the Van Halen era, who was now managing Dave. And we're probably at this point before the DLR band record uh, has come out, but that's sort of around the corner. So, um, meaning at this point, he hasn't made a record. This, this is sort of in the stretch where he was now no longer on Warner Brothers had done this Vegas run that was not successful and was kind of cooking up the DLR band idea and that whole project. So Eddie reaches out to me and essentially is like, we love your review. Dave read it. He loves it. And I'm just like, what? Like, I couldn't believe it. And he's like, we love it so much that we want that type of writing and that attitude towards Dave to be the way his press releases are. And 
and, and oh, and, and let me back this up by saying I was a publicist at this time. I was writing, but I was also working uh, at different management and PR companies as a publicist. And I actually think that's maybe how Eddie tracked me down. I think now that I think about it, I think he tracked me down at my work and that somehow he figured out I was a publicist or something. And um, maybe through their publicist, which was MSO. Mitch Schneider organization. They're not around anymore. Anyway, so he tells me, you know, we're represented at Mitch Schneider organization. We have a publicist there, but we do not like the way Dave is being profiled. We don't like all this bad press, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he's doing some cool stuff. And like, we want press releases written that have this voice that you have. And I'm kind of like, okay, but isn't he represented by MSO? Yeah, well, we're just going to pay you out of pocket to uh, become like an addendum to MSO. And I was like, all right. And he asked me my rate to write press releases. And I just quoted him something out of my fucking ass. And they were like, you're hired. And the first one was Sergeant Bilko. The movie with Steve Martin, Sergeant Bilko has Dave bad habits. doing bad habits. And they sent me a version of bad habits and uh, sent me a screener of the movie, I think, or at least of that scene. So I knew what I was talking about and asked me to write. And Eddie asked me to write a press release about Dave's inclusion in this, although it's not on the soundtrack, I don't think. No, it's in the movie very quickly, too. And he sounds great on that track. That's a track I really like. Yeah. Yeah. So I wrote up a press release in my Dave is the greatest style and they paid me. And it came out through MSO. I don't even remember if my name was on it. I just know I wrote it. And we did a few more of those. And at that point, I started, at that point, I moved on to a company called Red Ant. They were a record uh, record label. And Red Ant is actually where the artist Hellraiser and Sons of Man, which were Wu-Tang Clan offshoots, were signed. And as you know, I made a movie about Hellraiser, uh, who's a great Wu-Tang Clan family rapper who has suffered a brain aneurysm and lost his ability to rap. So around this time, I'm 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 roll I'm rolling with uh, you know my punk rock scene. I'm rolling with my Wu-Tang guys. Uh, I'm working at this company called Red Ant, and I'm writing for fanzines. And I discovered this fanzine that I loved, I fell in love with, called Pop Smear out of New York. And Pop Smear was like a combination of the old Cream magazine meets like Mad Magazine meets kind of like a New York gritty pseudo porn magazine where it was like they were doing rock and roll and they were covering and doing interviews with porn stars and cartoons and comics and the stickers and giveaways. And just, it was just like, a, I was like, man, this is a great, this is a great magazine. I loved it. I loved the writing. I loved the attitude. So because I was a publicist and being sent this stuff, I just like looked at who the editor was, called up uh, the editor of Pop Smear and really just called to say, man, I love what you're doing. There's a lot of my career and how I've sort of met people along the way is like when I like what someone else is doing, I if I can, I usually reach out and go, I like what you're doing. And that sometimes creates unions, friendships, sometimes goes nowhere. But in this case, you know, I was like, yeah, that's a fancy. And I could probably get this guy on the phone. I call him up and man, I love what you guys are doing, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he said, send me some writing samples. You know, okay, what do you do? I'm a a publicist, but I'm also a writer. Okay, send me some writing samples. So I sent him some writing samples and he gets back to me. He's like, dude, you're better than half my writers here. He's like, why aren't you writing for me? I'm like, I I don't know. I guess I should be. He's like, well, what do you want to write about? You tell me what feature you want to deliver and that feature will make it into my magazine. And I went, actually, I have an in with David Lee Roth. Diamond David Lee Roth, <laughs> you know, uh, the David Lee and, Roth. Yeah, and I'm like, I'm pretty sure. No way. Hold on. Let me. Let me. Sorry, it's, it's a long time ago. There was one little thing in between here, which is the first thing I wrote for Pop Smear was. Um, no, no, no. I take it back. The follow up was Thor. You know the heavy metal guy Thor. Oh yeah, you did a yeah. movie on. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. After the David Lee Roth interview, when they were like, with you know, oh, this was great. Got any other rock stars you want to interview? I was like. Thor, the rock and roll gladiator. And that was a whole other situation that, that also stemmed out of pop spirit. Anyway, so I said, I got this in with um, David Lee Roth. I'd never met Dave at this point, by the way. I was only talking to Eddie Anderson, but Eddie was being very, very cool to me. And they paid me to write some stuff. So I was like, hey, man, I'm, you know, shit, dude, I'm working for David Lee Roth. Let's do it. So I said, if you'll uh, let me pitch it let me see if i can get an interview with david lee roth he goes you get me david lee roth it's a guaranteed cover story and again no one was putting dave on the cover of anything at this point so a lot of like the way these stars align is just that like i caught him you know 
and treated him like he was still on top, maybe in an era when he wasn't quite so on top. And I think they dug my sort of just blind enthusiasm. And I wasn't too, too jaded at that point. I was just a kid, you know. So um, I pitch it. Eddie says, sure. He said, oh, yeah, Dave reads all the fanzines. That's how we knew about you from Pork Chops and Applesauce. He's got a subscription to Pop Smear, they told me. I was like, whoa, damn, Dave's hip. So we set it up that I'm going to go over to Eddie Anderson's house. I'm trying to think. Let me. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm mixing. I'm, there's, there's a bunch of Dave interviews. So let me let me back up. The very first one was at Chateau Marmar. And that is a, a hotel on Sunset Boulevard. Thanks. And Eddie, Eddie arranged it for me to meet Dave there. And I was waiting in the lobby. And that was the plan. And 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 there was one other thing, which is I, we were trying to set this interview up forever. And the only thing that I had that week was a gig on like a Friday night playing with my street walking cheetahs, my punk band at this uh, dive bar called Bar Deluxe. And we were playing at like 11 o'clock, right? So I was like, as long as it doesn't get set up for Friday night, we're fine. Eddie calls me on like Wednesday and goes, we can do it Friday night. Fuck. What time? He's like, you know, like seven or eight. I'm like, all right, shit. I really would love more time. I'm gonna have to rush out of this thing, but fuck. Yes, I'll do it. I'll take it. So I'm waiting at Chateau Marmar and it's just also like, man, I hope this fucking goes. Dave walks in in full leather outfit, leather chaps, leather pants, leather jacket, leather, you know, like just basically as rock starred out as he possibly could be. This is when he still <laughs> had the full long blonde hair, yeah. you know, like the DLR era, you know what I mean? You know, the, the look. And uh, he he just came in like it was just like whoa and we he sat down with me we ordered some whiskeys and we talked for two three hours which as you know with dave was i asked him like two questions and he just went on and on and on right i do the same thing so i get it <laughs> um it was a great interview and we talked a lot about van halen which at that point he hadn't been doing a lot of talking about Van Halen. What did he say? And, well, I mean, to be honest, that interview has been so widely quoted. That's the first one of a bunch I did with him. And that one, he talked a lot about like, what you know, the, the, the boys up on, what did he call Howdy Doody Mountain? Right. That whole Howdy Doody Mountain thing about his cold water, that's all from that interview. Like, those you know are the what, first Frank, this I is, heard him do. This is wild. Sorry to interrupt, but I, in my radio days, I used to take notes and, and keep them all for, for show prep. And I think I had your article. Now that I, I think might've. about it, because yeah, I just I, I mean, remember there was a ton of stuff in there, and it was at a time when you didn't get you didn't get to hear about him that much. Exactly. And I used to was, keep all the stuff in binders, so I just and used to be. And he was being really specific too, which I mean, again, I I have to go back to read that article again. But what I remember thinking at the time is that, you know, Dave always did a lot of kind of dancing around the subject. He was hard to pin him down on stuff. I think I just caught him in a time when maybe he wasn't doing as many interviews or maybe he felt he needed to pull some shit out to make it more interesting since he wasn't quite i don't know why mm. i don't know why i got this three hour you know really really honest detailed interview he talked a lot about his anger towards van halen and sometimes in a you know in a fun david lee roth way but i felt at the time i was like wow kind of shocked by like sort of how well this is going essentially yeah well did you so, also feel like you know he was bummed that he wanted to be back that he was really i definitely got the impression because that's that around that point. time yeah he definitely wanted back um and at that point maybe he was, was trying to get to their attention through you maybe, maybe. You know, dave and a lot of the stuff he does you know he doesn't do anything without something without an in, in intention to to do something all, you know also might have been a there also might have just been an element of like this was a fanzine and it was in a more punk rock audience and dave's a hip guy and dave knows exactly what that meant and there might have been an element too where he's like yeah you know this one isn't with rolling stone like right. maybe i can be a little bit more freewheeling and kind of you know really talk some you know just say what's on my mind uh again all done within that dave style but if you read that interview in context with what what he had talked about regarding the Van Halen breakup and his post career up until that point, other than his book, I don't really feel like he'd done a lot of really super long candid interviews at that point. So somehow or another, I got one out of it and it turned out to be the first of a bunch. Um, so what happened is that came out and it did really well. 
uh, in that it was well received and a lot of like radio people picked up on his quotes about Van Halen and stuff. And it just sort of got him. I wouldn't say that that thing put him back on the map, but I think it was just a little dose of good press and maybe some street cred since it was from a fanzine, um, you know, that he needed at that time. So quickly after, like really quickly after I get another call from Eddie and Eddie's like, Dave wants to do part two. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I'm thinking like, I mean, Jesus. Oh, wait, wait, hold on. Wait, I got to back it up. So we're closing the interview. And because I'm looking at my clock at the Chateau Marmar going like, I got to get to this gig. And I'm, I'm literally, I had to go, Dave, I got to go. Can you imagine telling your all time? Radio, I can't, <laughs> I don't have time for this anymore. I got to go. And he's like, oh yeah, cool, cool. And uh, I was like, Dave, I got to tell you, man, I gave him a single. I was like, I have, I'm in this band called the Street Walking Cheetahs. And uh, here's our single. And I'm playing down the street. If there's any chance you're free now, I'll, you know, drinks on me. Uh, come and come check out my band. He goes, well, Frank, it's either your band or the strippers and crazy girls. What do you think? And I'm like, understood. <laughs> understood i said I'll, and he goes but if you can get out by 2 a.m i'll be at crazy girls i'm like okay so i race over to my gig and i tell the guys guys we're cutting three songs from the set i gotta be out of here as soon as possible <laughs> i'm like rushing the whole night along we played everything really fast and i got us off stage as soon as possible no in between and no in between song no, banter no, just, just like, go. One, two, three, four. You know, I was like, let's go, 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 go. Like the Ramones. One, two, three, yeah, four. Yeah, just screaming for an encore. I'm like, no encore. <laughs> Pack up my shit. I grab my friend Lindsay Parker from Pork Shops and Applesauce right. Magazine and my buddy John Anderley, the son of uh, famous record executive David Anderley. And um, and I ran over to Crazy Girls and it, we caught it maybe an hour before it shut down and Dave kept the place open. They kicked everybody out, but the but the, you know, door guys and the girls and me and Lindsay and John and David Lee Roth and the bartender. And he kept it open till 5 a.m. and just bought us drinks and lap dances for the rest of the night. And then did a whole part two of the interview with me. But it was, but at that point, I didn't put the recorder on because we're in a strip club. And I'm like, we're just meaning he and I continued to just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And he kept telling stories. But at that point, we were off the record. Uh, I, I did not record any of the stuff in the strip club. There's also music playing, you know. So anyway, so that interview comes out. It does well. And uh, Eddie Anderson calls me for a part two. And he says, this time, I want you to come meet me at my place and then follow me to Dave's place in Pasadena. He's letting you uh, come over to his house. And I'm like, woo. So my editor not the editor the publisher from pop smear magazine who owned the magazine james morrell who was a great guy and still is a great guy a good friend of mine uh he happened to have plans to be in la he's a new york guy but he was going to be in la that weekend so I, I go eddie you know we just did an article with dave on the cover it's hard for me to get them to do another cover and he, and he asked me he goes it, it'll be a cover story right and i go well I mean, normally, yes, but like we just had you on the cover like a month ago. So I'm, I'm, it's going to be tough for me to go back. I mean, yes, they'll run the interview, the second interview. Of course they will. But I don't know if I can guarantee a cover unless you were to let the publisher come along because he happens to be in town. Super cool guy. And I'm sure if he hangs out and watches me interview Dave, it's a fucking cover story. And he goes, all right. So now I get James to go with me. Me and James roll over to Eddie Anderson's place in Hollywood, meet him there, meet his girlfriend, hang out for a little bit. Eddie was always great to me, super nice guy. Um, and then we uh, followed him to Dave's, you know, the place that he bought from his dad, the Pasadena mansion, where you've seen many music videos shot and photo sessions and stuff. Along the way, he stops at a liquor store and he goes, I'll be right back. And we're just, you know, we're behind him. And uh, he comes out with a box and it's got a full bottle of Patron, full bottle of Jack Daniels, cases of beer, bottles of wine, mixers, everything. And I'm just like, oh, shit, it's going to be a party. So it's we, on. It's on. So we roll into Dave's place and he gives he, he comes out. He's got sweats and a tank top, you know, essentially. Um and hey, it's Frank Meyer. What man? That's my man. Hey, James Morrell. Nice to meet you, man. Eddie, all right. And he basically says, Eddie, we're cool. And Eddie drops off the booze and splits. And now it's just me and James and Dave. And so Dave takes 
us on a tour of the house. Well, that's what I want to ask. You got to tell us about what what's inside Dave's mansion. Well, first he took us outside, and outside was three tennis courts and a giant garden that had everything from like corn and sunflowers. I mean, like a big garden like you'd see in a farm. And I'll I'll never forget it. Frank, you ever smelled a fresh onion right out of the ground? I go, no. And he reaches into the ground and pulls out a fucking giant onion and with his hands, like like Thor himself, twists it in half and breaks it in half and sticks it under my nose. And I'm like, wow. And he goes, freshest <laughs> goddamn onion you've ever smelled. And I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the guy is an amazing, he's an amazing guy. Love him. Um, so he gives me a tour of the grounds. He's got a garage with like four cars in it and all this stuff, including the car um, from the Hopper Teacher video. Oh, cool. And it was in his garage. And uh, like it had the covers on it and stuff, but he you know popped it open for us. And um, he took us inside. He, there's multiple floors. We did not go upstairs. We were just on the downstairs area. What I can tell you is he had a whole room that was like a costume room and it was all of his outfits that you've seen, like the eat him and smile outfit, like all of his stage wear, all on racks and then like a desk with, um, you know, like a row of like sunglasses and a row of like crazy glasses and a row of like bracelets. And it was like, you know what I mean? All of his shit for him to get become the David Lee Roth rock star was just all in one room. Like it was crazy. I was just like, whoa. That's cool. And in the Panama video, and you also see it a lot in the No Holds Barbecue. They shot they shot all of No Holds Barbecue at Dave's house for the most part, except for maybe the underwater stuff or whatever. But all that, those checkered floors and stuff. I was going to say like the checkered that. floor. I've yeah. seen so many videos of that checkered floor. That's so. That's his essentially, um, kind of the main hallway entryway that then divides, like you know, meaning you you'd come in through the front door into that checkered. Um, floor and then the other rooms the dining room and the living room and the costume room all feed off of that and then it goes up to a stairwell that leads up to the second floor which we didn't go to and so um other thing that i remember oh. is that he had this giant car and i wish i knew more about car i'm not a big car expert guy but he had like an old you know 50s or early 60s or whatever you know kind of hot rod looking car mounted above the fireplace in that sort of foyer area the mercury it was the yeah it was i think it was the mercury the low rider i think i i that sounds right and what he the said red yes and I think, he said I, it, I, yeah i think he it's, said it was he said it was the first car he ever had he goes see that he probably would let's call it a mercury mercury blah 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 first car i ever had sex in mounted it on the wall <laughs> That's what he told me. That was the first car he ever had sex in, and then he mounted the front grill on the front end on the wall. He has such an enthusiasm for life, right? I mean, in person as he is off stage, like just sure, absolutely, absolutely. larger than life. And he's smart as hell, you know. Yes, he really is a smart guy. He's, well read, you know, yeah. Well read, very smart. He's he can be kind of scatterbrained, so sometimes you got to yes. kind of piece things together. Or much like again, much like me, you got to you know go. Oh, remember you right, right. mentioned this, but like uh, he is a really really sharp smart funny intelligent man who is uh, a fun guy to talk to even if you weren't a fan of his of his art uh, i think if you just met him you'd be like man what an interesting guy anyway so um then what that began was so then that article came out so uh i'll tell you one other funny thing about his house was just that there was a back house and the back house had a, like a studio in it. He had a steel guitar. He had a, a recording situation. I don't remember exactly what it was. I want to say there might've been like reel to reels in there, CD player, but anyways. Uh, and we, you know, we drank and smoked a lot. I, I pulled out a tiny little joint. I brought a little like pinner, like, Hey man, me and Dave, I was like, I'm going to smoke that pot with David Lee Roth. And he, he kind of looked at it like, yeah, sure. And we uh, smoked my <laughs> tiny little joint. And he's like, now nah, let me pull out mine. And he pulls out like the biggest bag of weed I've ever seen. And one of those giant Cheech and Chong rolling papers is like, is like a paper towel, basically. And he rolls the biggest joint to this day that I've ever smoked in my entire life. 
And he just he like it was like a you know he had like a small baseball bat. He's like, yeah, smoke <laughs> this. And me and James were just like, whoa, fuck, holy mackerel. Well, that just so, explains though he's not all show, man. This shit is legit. No, it was you for know, real. Not... And we polished oh, the man. whole bottle of Jack and the whole bottle of Patron. Three of us. <laughs> So, I mean, the, I think the Jack we were drinking with Cokes, the Patron we were drinking straight, but there was definitely a point when I went into, oh, by the way, he was also playing us music, but he was, the stuff that, you know, okay, so remember when we had the the radio show on the internet? Yes. Uh, all that material he played us that night. Like yeah, there's, that, there's. He was playing us mambo instrumentals. He was playing us the. He did studio recordings with the mambo band that I don't think have ever come out. And he played us that stuff. He played us a bunch of instrumentals. He played us a bunch of blues stuff, and he played us a lot of the stuff that a few years later, when he was doing that radio show on his website, a lot of those covers and right. stuff like Glad All Over and all that stuff. He played us all that stuff. That yeah, night. yeah, yeah. It was really very cool. eclectic too. His his interests musically are. All over the oh, yeah. For yeah. sure. And yeah, he was playing us like I also think that some of the stuff that ended up on that um Diamond Dave album, right? The, the disco album, that he might have been playing us some of that stuff too. Anyway, so he played us all sorts of cool cool stuff. And then I went to his bathroom to go take a leak. And and I did have this moment where like I was so wasted, like the room started kind of spinning. And I just remember like hyper focusing and being like, do not throw up in David Lee Ross. <laughs> do not throw up in David Lee Ross. Do not. And I had to summon all my energy. At that point, I was probably again like, all right, Dave, we got to get out of here. So I was like, this could get ugly really soon. And so me, James, like I had to drive. So I was obviously should not have been driving, but on some level was trying to kind of keep together. James didn't have to drive. He was from New York. He was having the time. It's like, he was on the floor at this point, just like completely, <laughs> you know, like liquefied. And so me and Dave fucking dragged James into my car and literally David Lee Roth is stuffing James into my car. And he's like, uh, are he going to be all right? And I'm like, I think so. Luckily he's not driving. So he's like, all right, Meyer, take it easy, man. And I take off and I'm driving down, um, you know, his long driveway. Please don't, you know, destroy his walls or driveway. Gate opens. I immediately pull away from his entrance, pull over, open my door and just vomit profusely. <laughs> I got it all out of my system. Oh, Took James did. home and James missed his flight. Because James walked into his apartment. He was staying with a friend. He put his key in, the door opened, and then he, boom, and he passed out there with the door open, key in the door, unconscious till he woke up after his flight. Oh, man. It's crazy. Longest hangover you've ever had? Uh, best hangover. So the best hangover because, you know, yeah, we yeah. got such a good prize for, for right. sticking it through. But so then that interview came out. Actually, quickly, was it hard to to get it like fans would have a hard time trying to get into his compound there right i mean it must have been pretty well guarded yeah 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 it's it, it, it is it, it's a there's like a giant gate there's a wall around the whole thing there's you know yes it's, it's right. not like you could just wander in there because he mean, did have that I'm story sure. remember the guy showed up uh, and he, he and dave came out with a shotgun well i mean look if someone wants to break into somewhere they'll break into somewhere yeah but the reality is it ain't easy you'd have to be you, you're scaling walls and fences and you know to to do anything like that i mean it's pretty it's a they don't call it a compound for yeah. a reason it's not put it this way it's not just a big house it's a compound it yeah. is you know it, it was owned by his dad and redone by dave and basically designed to keep motherfuckers like me out unless yeah. i'm invited yeah. <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> and you so uh, he doesn't want no fans coming in there unless he you happen to get invited like I yeah did. um so then at that point um the way it kind of went down was that like i just kind of had access at that point like whatever dave did i got the call so if he was doing shows i'd get asked do you want to get on the list if he was doing um a rehearsal i went to rehearsals i went to some recording sessions if he was doing anything i it was just kind of eddie would just be like hey dave's doing this you know you want to pitch it around i mean there was an understanding that like yeah i could come and hang but they would really appreciate it if i could get stuff placed and at that point my friend Lindsay, who had run uh pork chops and applesauce fanzine was now the music editor at yahoo uh, and launch if you remember launch so mm -hmm. i had some friends like like me that had been moving up the ranks and i was writing for all these different things so yeah i was like yeah man you know oh when they launched the sam and dave tour they gave me full access to both of them for interviews and stuff 
Um, I was writing for the Van Halen Insider at that point, so I was able to get stuff for Jeff Hausman's magazine mm-hmm. that maybe he wasn't able to get at that point. Um, and so I just kind of had a good relationship with them. And one interesting thing is when he did that Finland concert in 1999, which was essentially Atomic Punks were his backing band at that point. It's a great show. Uh, it's on YouTube. Yeah, and it's around the DLR band era. Um, he did a full rehearsal at a place in the Valley, and they invited me down to that. And I brought my wife and my uh, two buddies who played in a punk rock band called the B-Movie Rats. And they were as big of Van Halen nerds as I was. So, I was, And they knew about my my relationship now. So I'm like, Frank, we got to meet David. We got to like, all right, you can come, I'm, I'm going to work it out. Because now I felt good enough with Eddie, I could be like, hey, can I bring a few people to this rehearsal thing? Yeah, yeah, man, we want to have some people there, man. Dave will love it. Great. So um, so we go to this rehearsal and they ran through the entire headlining, like 90 minute set in real time, all Van Halen songs. Except and he included Van Slam Van Dunk. Dunk. Yeah, he did Slam Dunk and he might have, did he do Yankee Rose? He might have done Yankee Rose. But other so. than that, I mean, it was basically just all Van Halen stuff. First time I'd seen Dave do that, like all Van Halen set. It, he was so close that when he, was doing on Panama reach down between my legs again he's in the full leather he's walking my, we're all sitting on the floor and he walks up and he's got his crotch and the leather pants right in my wife's face <laughs> like reach down between and she loved Dave but she's like whoa yeah. like hey and and at that point also you know like I said Dave now had met my wife had met my, you know Lindsay Parker and Scott Chernoff and some of the people I was like collaborating and writing with so like when I walk into these things every time David Lee Ross Every time he'd go, Frank Meyer, you know, and that was always like I walk in and usually anyone I brought around Dave, they would see him go, Frank Meyer, and they'd be like, damn, fuck, like he, he really does know you. This is crazy. So we're doing, you know, we're sitting on the floor watching him rehearse, the whole thing's great. But I think one of the reasons why maybe things always worked out so well for me at this point is that I never pushed it. And and I didn't do too much like fawning and fanning over him unless we were talking specifically for an article. But if we were just hanging or whatever, I kind of just, you know, I sort of learned this from Frank Zappa, the way he treated me. Just just talk to people normally and they'll, you'll, you'll be fine. So I never if I got the idea that like the party's wrapping up, Dave, great to see you. Let's you know, I'm out. You know, uh, I never needed to be told to leave or. I think no one ever felt like I was like pushing my uh, or taking advantage of. My yeah, situation. you read the room and you know when it's time to. Yeah, get exactly. So I, you know, the basically uh, they finished this rehearsal and there's a little lounge area and Dave and the band are sitting there and I think they might have even recorded it and we're like listening. I think they had recorded it and we're listening back, and um, and I see people start to leave and I'm kind of like, all right, cue to go. So me and my wife, my two homies go up to dave and i go dave you know thank you so much man so great you invite me eddie appreciate it you know frank meyer the missus blah 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 you know and then we split and i just and then i hear my buddies saying the same thing to hey dave so you know four friends of frank and i just kind of split we get in the car we go the next day morning i call my friend derek from the B movie rats and he answers the <gasps> like all fucked up and i'm like Derek, what's up man you okay it's like it's like 11 dude it's not even that early oh man i didn't get in until 6 a.m what did you do after the david lee roth show we went to oh i was with dave the whole night i'm like what he goes you and the missus left and we went up to dave and said hey we're friends of frank's thanks so much for having us and he pulled out a bottle of jack daniels and said well you ain't leaving until you take a shot of this are you and I said to Dave, well, I ain't starting on that unless we finish it. And he goes, sit down. Uh-huh. <laughs> and he sat him down and they drank all night. Two oh, dudes man. he had just met who just happened to be, you know, say the right thing. And he was like, take a seat. And he, they're like, dude, Dave drank us under the table. I, you know, I got out of there at like 5 a.m., got sleep at 6. I'm like, oh, my God. Wow. I'm like, maybe I'm too cool when I leave the room. I'll quit like that. Like, fuck, I could have yeah. I could have meandered for a minute and had like this really wow. incredible night. So I saw him a few more times in concert, um, you know, locally when he would play like House of Blues or or right. go down to Orange County. Uh, there was a show in San Diego when he was touring with Bad Company. There was a co-headlining yeah. Bad Company. Uh, Jeff Hausman was at this show, actually. It was the first time I think we met in person. And there was going, Eddie invited me and told me specifically that we're doing Club Dave 
in the back. So I might not have necessarily driven to San Diego to go see Dave because at this point I was seeing him fairly frequently, but it was like club day. Oh, we're going. Hell so yeah. I bring my my pal, partner in crime, Scott Chernoff and my wife, and we roll down to San Diego and Dave was first they were, they were switching who played last and you know first on that and dave was first and bad company was second and we saw dave and it was like an outdoor arena show uh or you know, amphitheater type place and so when it was done we go backstage and he's got the whole backstage decked out sort of like the us festival footage where it's like sort of looked like a tropical hawaiian getaway and there's a full bar and there was bikini clad chicks with hawaiian lays and the whole thing so we're back there going like wow little this, people yeah, did we have the little people no in there no too? little okay. i don't <clears throat> think there was little people it was sort of after that era but he definitely was surrounded by babes and eddie being you know doing his like security guard thing and uh it was definitely a very 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 cool you know thing to be at and Dave comes out and he's got, you know, like a tropical suit on and he's got, you know, um, Hawaiian lays that he's doling out to people. And again, he sees him from across the room, Frank and the missus. And he puts lays on all of us. I still have mine to this day, of course. Um, and we hung out and party with Dave. I was going to be driving that night. So shockingly, I didn't drink. I'm pretty positive at some point a joint got passed around and I took a puff off a joint. So I'm sure my eyes were bloodshot, but I wasn't drunk. We leave the arena and I had just gotten a new car and like a fucking idiot, I peeled out of the concert parking lot and immediately reds and blues. I'm like, oh my God. So I get pulled over, but in my head, I'm like, well, I haven't been drinking. So should be okay, right? I get two cops, a young cop and an old cop. They run me through the drunk driving, you know, walk on the line, touch your nose, all that shit. I pass it with flying colors because I'm not drunk. Young guy shows the old guy. Old guy goes, run him again. So they run me through everything again, which I seemingly pass. And then they ask me to do a breath. Did they? Maybe they didn't have. No, I, I don't think I did a breathalyzer until I got to jail. Anyways, you'll see where this is going. Uh, <laughs> they had me run through everything again. And then again, I did fine. And he shows them like the results and he goes, book him. His eyes are red. He's on something. So they hand my very drunk wife the car keys and send her off drunk driving and arrest me. Cuffs fucking on the hood, right in front of my wife, toss her the keys, send her off, take me to jail. They take me to jail and they're like, uh, we know you're on something. We're going to get a blood test on you. And and I can't remember why they didn't breathalyze me or maybe they did and they just didn't believe it. or I don't know. I think maybe that's what it was. Maybe they, they breathalyzed and they just never told me what the results were and arrested me. And I was like, well, I don't know what could have happened there. But anyways... So I, I go to jail and they tell me they think I'm on drugs and they're going to take a blood test and find a nurse at the precinct. I'm like, fuck. Damn. So they take me to to the jail and the they're informed that all the nurses there are gone because there's a big accident on the freeway and they sent them all out there in ambulances. So I'm like, whoa. And they're like, all right, we'll go to the other precinct. They put me back in the squad car, take me all the way across town. No idea. I hardly look like I'm some crazy violent criminal nor am I drunk. They take me all the way to another precinct. Those nurses are also gone at the same accident. At that point, they give up. They throw me in jail. I was in jail for 14 hours, let out, and told I blew a 0.0. .0. So they just what blew me the in hell? jail because they just decided to. There you go. And there's no recourse so, you can't take? I mean, when we sue the San Diego Right, right. And, and their word against mine. I mean, the reality is, cop wants to arrest you, cop arrests you, and it's just like intent. I, he gave me a weird look. He reached. He, You know, anything. Like, I I, I smelled weed on him. He had I was going to say, you could up. say, I know you David know Lee Roth, but that probably would make it worse. Ew, that's the, the worst <laughs> thing. To say. Well, I think I did. I just came from the David Lee Roth Bad Company concert. They're like, <laughs> well, there step you out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> um so you know by the so, way th this speaks to dave dave wasn't kid when he said you know sammy throws a party i am the party i mean he wasn't bullshit. right about that yeah he, he is roll the party. Dave long enough and you are getting arrested and vomiting and, and the party just is things. him it's like as yeah. soon as you know wherever he is the party happens eddie anderson a lot of people wonder what happened there they him and dave had a falling out there was a lawsuit there or something i know that at some point i reached out to eddie 
or maybe Eddie reached out to me and and told me he was no longer with Dave. And I think at that point, Dave was still with MSO, which was the same publicity company. And he was with CAA, which was his agents. And I knew people at both. So I, I still kind of had some inroads to him at that time. But that definitely made my access a little tougher because, you know, like Eddie was my guy. So I don't really know what happened there. Um, and the last time I spoke to Eddie is I worked on Niels Lozauer's book, uh, Van Halen, A Visual History. Like I did a lot of the interviews and helped edit the whole thing and put it together. And we got an interview uh, from Eddie for that. That was probably the last time that was, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Mm. Um, but anyway, so I haven't heard from Eddie in a while. I always liked Eddie, no idea. But after that, Eddie, uh, Dave was working with a guy named Matt Sencio. Yep. And Matt became his manager up until Dave joined Van Halen and went over to Irving Azoff, right. which, who, who managed the rest of Van Halen at that point. Yeah. And the way that I met Matt, and this is a perfect segue, you just gave us into the 2000s. I think through MSO, maybe, I got tickets i you know man i don't know somehow i went to go see dave at the house of blues in anaheim and this would be just post dlr band era maybe cl coming up on the diamond dave era that that album uh and also at this point i'd written my first book ramones book and ramones and van halen played gigs together so like dave i had interviewed dave for the book there was some other stuff going on i also at one point me and scott chernoff the guy i told you about earlier who was my you know, partner in crime for a lot of that stuff. We had written an animated show called The Power League that was basically the concept was a bunch of celebrity, all animated, but a bunch of celebrities uh, have double identities as crime fighters and sort of like, you know, Shazam or, or the Scooby-Doo gang, like travel around in a van when they're not being rock stars and actors and solve crimes and help small towns and that kind of stuff. So it was like Scooby-Doo starring real real celebrities and it would be animated and then the celebrities themselves would do the voices and we had like lee uh lee majors from the fall guy and william shatner and a few other people that we somehow got attached to this thing and dave because of my relationship i went to eddie sent him the script for power league and was like we want dave to play dave and to be an animated cartoon character an immediate yes cool yep. You can attach him. He's down. Well, now, now I'm curious. How does this story end? Because we've well, never seen this. Uh, because it, that one ended because we actually, we got a big agent at that time. We went to the Gersh agency and they were pitching it around. And we got a deal with the Simpsons animators. Not a deal, but like a first look thing where basically we went in and pitched our show and they were like, we love it. And we told them, like, we want to go kind of Hanna-Barbera, old school looking Scooby-Doo. We're not looking to make something super expensive digital. You know, South Park was big at the time. So we're like, you know, it's OK if it looks a little shitty, but we don't want it to look too shitty. Blah, blah, blah. We had this idea, you know. But the what, animation was going to look like Dave. It was going to look like yes. William Shatner. Yep. We even had storyboards, a couple sketches drawn up. Wow, and stuff. that's so cool. And... uh this was all based on a comic book that Scott and I wrote in fifth grade. Scott and I have known each other since second grade. And Scott and I, somewhere around fourth or fifth grade, wrote a comic book called The Power League that starred David Lee Roth. And so essentially, once we were now, you know, becoming a little bit more professional in our careers, we were like, why don't we pitch the that stupid idea we had, The Power League, as a cartoon show? And so we took our comic book essentially and revamped it as a TV pilot script for an animated show, uh, pitched it around to some agencies, got a big agency involved with the agency involved. We're able to get the celebrities attached. I got us Dave attached personally. I just called up Eddie and he's like, yep, he's attached. And then um, we pitched it around. We got the Simpsons animators interested, but essentially despite how we kept telling them how we how 70s and 80s sort of 2d looking we wanted to look they came to us with a budget that was somewhere around a million an episode which was obviously a lot more than we thought anyone was going to sign to do a animated show starring lee majors and david lee roth you know what i mean like meaning yeah. that's a show you can pitch with like a a, a a reasonable budget you know what i mean but like 
to go and pitch a million dollar show around 70s icons and stuff and 80s icons doing this you know it's like mike tyson mysteries like th that show is an awesome animated show but one reason why it works is they're probably not spending a million dollars right. per episode so uh essentially once it was then being pitched around with them attached and that price tag attached we got passed on by every single network and then it just went away mm. so, which happens that, right I mean, that, which that happens kind of thing happens but so that was one thing i was doing with dave around that time in the ramones book and then um and there was a the dave book of, you were gonna do the well, Tower yeah of well I'll, so i'll lead up to matt sensio is kind of that that leads us into the dave book so essentially at this point dave's out doing gigs and Eddie's not with them anymore. So if I want to go to a show or whatever, I would usually call his publicist, um, the one who he had me writing press releases for. And um, I would get, you know, I'd get on the list for a show or something. So I, me and my buddy went down to see him in uh, House of Blues in Anaheim. And I got backstage and I'll, I don't even think I had a pass that allowed me on stage. I just sort of did it. I kind of just... Got as far as I could go with my credentials and then just went, I wonder if this door opens. It did. And I was like, well, I know how House of Blues were. I'd played the House of Blues. So I was like, this takes me to the stage. I just walked up and figured if someone threw me out, they threw me out. I walked up. Suddenly I'm on the side of the stage watching the show. And this guy looks at me and looks me over. And I'm like, uh oh, I'm about to get thrown out. And he goes, are you Frank Meyer? And I go, yeah. And he goes, oh, I'm Dave's new manager, Matt Sensio. He told me about you. Pleasure to meet you. And I'm like, oh, right on, Matt Sensio. What's happening? They finish. Matt takes me backstage. Frank Meyer, you know, what I mean? like, <laughs> like, ah, here we go. And it's, now it's been like a year or so, you know. And so I sit there and hang out with them backstage, and me and Matt exchange numbers. And now I'm dealing with Matt. And essentially, what happened there is, I definitely did a few more interviews that Matt arranged for just random stuff. I'm pretty sure something for Yahoo. Matt might have. Was Matt with him during? Uh... Well, anyways, uh, I did some random stuff that Matt got me access to, uh, just you know, interviews and stuff. And then I had at this point written the Ramones book, and probably had I written the Slow's Hour book yet? I don't think I worked on Slow's Hour. So I'd written the Ramones book, and it came out, and it did really well. And I was actually working with uh, Dave Mustaine on a book at this point, and. Um, I, you know, suddenly found success as an author, uh, which wasn't really part of my game plan. And so I came to Matt with a pitch to bring to Dave for a book called The Tao of Dave. And it was sort of rock and roll philosophy with David Lee Roth. The idea would be like, if you could ask Dave any question, like I'd been able to do all these years, what would you ask him? So and what what's Dave an expert in? Where to vacation? How to find a good guitar player? You know, best way to get a good scream? You know, how, do you go with spandex? Or do you, go, you know, like all the questions you would have for Dave, the energy, your best barbecue sauce, best, how much do you tip a stripper? How much do you tip him if you got two strippers? All the things you'd want to ask Dave about his career, about his life, about his lifestyle. And it would be, if anything, more of a lifestyle comedy kind of listing of anecdotes and quotes. And I had done so many interviews with him at this point that I thought, what if I just sort of comb through them, do a few more interviews and kind of put it in this format of more of like a philosophy book. And so I pitched that to Matt and he goes, oh, we love it. And so uh, I worked on a more formal pitch and a deck for that that they then passed on to Dave's agents at CAA and CAA said, we love it. We'll represent you. So now through Dave, I'm represented at CAA, which was way bigger agent than I had before. So um, it was in the early stages of us still sort of talking and shaping that pitch when Matt called me over to his house in the Valley. And that morning um, they had just announced the reunion tour with Hagar and I was under the impression from my conversations with Dave and Eddie and Matt that there already had been conversations post the MTV debacle, but there had been conversations with Dave and Eddie. I didn't know anything detailed about that, but somewhere between Dweezil and all these people, I had been hearing word that like Dave and Eddie were talking again. Eddie Van Halen. Eddie Van Halen. Yeah, right, right, um, right. Is know, this, this, this is, leading this to is the... now we're in early 2000s. Yeah, right, these are the, the demos. I'm gonna, we're... Yeah, okay. I'm getting into the demo story here, but that's sort of the segue into this whole other kind of you know, chapter in my relationship with Dave. So um, he calls me up and says, come over. Dave's got something he wants me to give you. 
and I go over and the first thing I say is like, man, so bummed out. They just announced the, um, oh, well, the thing that he wanted to give me is um, David Bowie and Mick Rock put out this very limited edition, incredible, huge photo book. I've got it sitting right there. You'll see where I go with this. Uh, it like it costs like, you know, a grand or something insane. Like it's you know, li- every one of them signed. I'm a big Bowie fan, but that's way out of my price range to pay for a book. He hands me that book. I open it. It is signed to David Lee Roth by David Bowie and Mick Rock. Yes. And he goes, Dave wants you to take this the book, the philosophy book. He wants you to comb through this and use this as inspiration. He likes your Ramones book. He likes the visuals of that but he kind of wants this too. So maybe you can start thinking about what our design and our look is. And I, I still have the book because that was the last time that I dealt with a manager essentially with Dave. So he hands me this book and I said, I got to tell you, man, I'm really bummed out that like they just announced the Hagar thing. I kind of got the impression that like Dave and Eddie were back talking and stuff. And he's like, yeah, they were, but you know, Eddie got the tongue cancer and um, you know, just, didn't, was sort of out of touch for a while and then by the time he got in touch was a little less enthused about the reunion with dave and then suddenly just like you we heard that he's back with hagar so i guess it's not happening mm. i'm like man that's such a huge huge drag and they go and i go you know and it's you know they made those songs uh in you know right around 97 you know on the, around the time of the mtv thing they did me wise magic and can't get this stuff no more and it sounded so great and he's like yeah i know i know and, and then those recordings in 2000 and i'm like yeah wait what <laughs> i had never heard that and i was like what do you mean the recordings in 2000 he goes yeah well i guess most people don't know this but dave went over to 5150 and they started cutting a new record i'm like a what a new record with original material and i'm like what are you talking about, Matt? Like, I've not heard this before, not yeah. from you, from, not from anyone. He's like, well, we kept it under wraps. And I'm like, and what, what do you mean? They recorded this stuff? And he goes, yeah, they recorded it. And I'm like, well, what is it? Like, what does it sound like? He goes, want to hear? And I went, yeah. And he took me into his living room and popped out a tape. And what that tape was, as he explained, was live in the studio board tapes of them recording live in the studio. So presumably a live vocal and a live guitar part and everything. To my knowledge, it's Michael Anthony. I was going to say, it's got to be. Unless they recorded it as a three piece and Eddie redubbed the bass himself. Right, that's possible. possible. Sure. I don't know because I'm the only person to my knowledge who has any idea this shit exists. But but yeah, Wolfgang's, think... Wolfgang's eight or nine at that time. So we can right. assume he and, was well, not. And also, and also I wasn't aware that there was any bad blood with Michael. So I don't think it even occurred to me to ask, like, is that Michael on bass? I just assumed he's like, this is Van Halen in the studio from a couple of years ago. And is Dave singing on those two? Dave is singing. Right. And every song stopped halfway through somewhere right before, during or after the solo or bridge or whatever the sort of middle section was, the song would just stop on a dime. And I said, what's the deal with that? And he goes, well, they're recording it at 5150, which is Eddie's studio. And even though they're back in touch, there's still a little distrust there. And he kind of figured like, well, what happens if I just go and do all this new stuff? They kick me out of the band again or, you know, or, or like it doesn't work out. And now Eddie's got all the tapes and they show up as bonus tracks on a Van Halen box set or something. Right. And they get paid for it. And Dave does. Yeah. He's like, so we just made sure that was part of the agreement that if Dave went in the studio with them, that none of the songs until they officially went to go record would be completed in their entirety as far as recordings go. And everyone agreed on that. So they played me four Four. or five songs. I I mean, four for sure that I remember Um, again, it was such a crazy blinding moment. It could have been a fifth, but um, the one that the first one that I heard that really just blew me away just is he played me as is, mm-hmm. but without the intro. So it doesn't have that whole sludgy intro. It just came right in with, which is a very hot for teacher moment. You know, that whole song boogie wise has a hot for teacher sort yep. of structure and stuff. So again, imagine my surprise when he's telling me like they went into the studio, all new material. Here's what it sounds like. And it basically goes into hot for teacher part two. 
my fucking brain exploded. I it was, was everything like, you had hoped for. Everything I hoped for, it was it was happening. Yeah, yeah it wasn't like, like, the, like Guns N' Roses Chinese democracy, like no, going in a whole like, different direction. No, yes, it sounded yes. like Van Halen right. exactly where they left off. I just couldn't wow. believe it. Uh, so it was Trouble with Never. He played me Honey Baby Sweet yep. Doll and Blood and Fire. Yeah, Blood and Fire. And I remember four. Blood and Fire. Because that has the line, look at all the people here tonight. Yeah. And I remember when that line hit me at that moment, I it was like, whoa. Like goosebumps. That, I, yeah, I was like, whoa. Like, Absolutely. Not goosebumps. only is it, and at this point, those two, those also, those are the originals off the record in that those are the ones that are not based on the older ideas. And I have no problem with the fact that they recycled old ideas from the early days to that record because, man, the ideas they recycled are incredible from the Corey days. But these were the originals that they had. These were the new songs they wrote so that then when they took that next break before they reunited with Dave and then eventually hit the studio, the album was basically these songs and remakes of uh, some of the old ones. And that's the material they pulled from. What so that first half, I got to hear the demos, of, which to my knowledge, only Wolfgang and Alex would be the only other people that got that stuff. What a story. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy, man. And speaking so, of Frank Meyer, I love the 07 reunion story because I think you could read his lips as he's walking in because you're there at that press conference. <laughs> well, what's funny about you it, you told too, me that to look for it. That's how now I know. What was funny about it is, so that was, again, like, so, I, you know, I mean, Matt Sensio is my guy. We're working on this book. And I... Uh, we're, we're going to get started on the actual interviews, like the new interviews for the book over the summer. And I got that summer and I got a call from Matt saying, Dave's going to take the summer off and go to New York and be an EMT and we'll pick it up in the fall. Okay. And I went, this is All the right. Dow of Dave book. There's the Dow of Dave book getting briefly put on hold while Dave goes to be an EMT in New York. And as the story goes, that's when Howard Stern left the air. That's when K-Rock offered Dave the radio spot. So I was supposed to resume then, you know, let's call it September with Dave on the book. But instead, he took the radio gig. So again, I'm told, like, first I was told he's taking the summer off to be an EMT. And then I was told he's taking, he's pushing it back because he just got this opportunity to replace Howard Stern. I'm like, Whoa, well, that's cool. Great. Good for Dave. So I'm just kind of on hold waiting for Dave to get back from all these adventures. Then the next thing I hear is Dave's reunited with Van Halen. And then the next thing I hear is Dave's fired Matt Sensio and is now with Irving Azoff Management. Now, the only reason why that was not a sinking ship for me is the first record company I ever worked at. Well, no, not the first. The second record company, first major label, essentially, that I worked at was called Giant Records. Guess who the CEO of Giant Records was? Irving Azoff. My dad was an entertainment attorney at Universal for Irving Azoff. So believe it or not, I had an in with Irving Azoff yeah. as well. So when I heard Dave's over with Irving Azoff, I was like, okay, maybe I can still get this book happening. Maybe I've still gotten in there. I think I sent Irving and his, his secretary was a friend of mine. I think I sent them the book pitch and just never heard back. And I'm wild guessing it's just because... At that point, the reason that he was with Irving Azoff was to rejoin Van Halen. And so anything that was Dave Solo was just off the books right now. It was just all about getting that relationship mended, figuring out how to present it to the world, blah, blah, blah. So basically, even though I was hoping my in with Irving was going to yield, you know, me kind of staying in the mix, it doesn't didn't really do that. But now months have gone by and the rumors that they're reunited you know people know they're back together they decide to hold a press conference and formally announce it and formally bring out wolfgang also as the bass player it was at a hotel the beverly some but beverly beverly hills hotel and i had a friend at warner brothers this woman named renee harrison and so i call up renee and i go renee you got to get me into the uh, press release for the van halen thing at this point i just want to go because I just wanted to go because it's them reuniting. I just want to see it. So it's huge. Uh, and I wasn't there for any press outlet. I was just there to watch it. So um, I went and I'm and and she even said to me, she goes, yeah, I can hook you up. But don't you know, Dave? And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, he's Dave and he switched management companies. I'm not I don't want to pursue that. I just want to go and watch this thing. Can you hook me up? She says, yeah, I got you. 
So I get there and me and Renee are standing at the front of the velvet rope. And we're in this room where they basically got, there's a big door they're going to enter through. And then you kind of a walkway with velvet rope holding off all the press. And then a stage with a podium where Dave and then Eddie and stuff would get up and kind of make their, their speeches to the press and take questions and stuff. And we're just standing there. And again, right before the lights go down and jump comes on the uh, speaker system, she goes, don't you know, Dave, didn't you like, interview him a bunch you like been to his house and stuff and i'm like yeah but you know he's from diamond david lee roth like i'm just a dude i'm a press guy you know what i mean and it's been a few years at this point and all my ends to him are no longer so whatever man you know it, it, it ain't no thing and um lights go down door opens dave eddie alex wolfgang they all walk out the lights are on people are applauding freaking out and dave spots me and goes frank meyer and goes beelining for me and gives me a hug like breaks the fucking belt you know goes over the velvet road good to see you buddy and i walked away and then my friend turns to me and goes well i fucking say you know him and i'm like <laughs> i guess i did i didn't i didn't see that, that one coming. Is awesome so we do that they do the whole press conference and dave's in full i'm back mode and uh and he goes to take you know, now can we get any uh, questions from the illustrious press? Every hand goes up except mine because I wasn't there as a press guy. And he goes, Frank Meyer, and points to me as the first question he takes in Van Halen since he's reunited. And my hand That's wasn't awesome. even up. He just goes, he did you a Meyer. solid. Yeah. Yeah. And I, he also probably knew I'd softball him one too. Not <laughs> so, which, I, of course, I did. I go, oh, well, uh, Frank Meyer here, uh, independent press outlet. Uh, uh, Dave, um, what kind of material can we expect on this tour? Well, I'm glad you asked, Mr. Meyer. You can expect the grand stand. He went into his whole feel. Questions, please. Who's got a question? Somebody yell something out. I can. I can't Hello. see. Go I, ahead, my I, friend, right there. Go ahead. Yeah. Are you guys going to be playing any of the uh, newer material you might have written, or the stuff you did for the greatest hits a while back? Are you talking about the two songs uh, from back when? You know, there is a, uh, a catalog that is as familiar as do 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 do. People uh, to this day stop in crosswalks and act out the guitar solos in front of me in 23 different cities here. So there's sort of a provided thing. You know, when the three tenors get together, you only wait for O Solo Mio and the rest of it you can barely pronounce. With this, you know every single song, you know every guitar lick, every, every kick, every jump, every drum lick, and we can't afford to shirk that duty. Besides that, we haven't learned those two songs yet. <laughs> If there's one regret that I have throughout all of this, I never once took a picture with Dave. And mainly it was for the thing I told you before, which was just I just sort of found that it worked to my benefit to not seem like a fan beyond the obvious of like, well, yeah, of course, I'm interviewing you because I know who you are and I like you and I'm a fan. So I mean, obviously, I'm a fan. But once I'm kind of having my moment with someone, I don't do a lot of, I'm not going to ask someone for their autograph. I don't take selfies with people. Like I just don't do that shit because I feel like if someone's going to take you seriously, potentially as anything more than just a fan, maybe take you in as a friend or at least just sort of like a, Hey, this guy's cool. He doesn't sweat me so much as the, like, I'd rather be that guy and not the guy like, Oh, fucking Myers coming over. I got to He's going to, I'm going to be yeah. on this Instagram with all my shit hashtagged in a minute. Like, I ain't going to do that. And even and well, back then, I wasn't doing it. Just to stuff, speak to know? that quickly, I met him in New York City, and and I just remember people coming up to him. We got, it was at the Beacon Theater in New York City, and all these, this one guy was just, oh, literally doing this. Go, oh, without you, Dave, I wouldn't, you know, and, and yeah. Dave's cool about and you, it. It was like, dude, what are you doing? How do you react to that? When yeah, I met him, can't. I just kept it short and sweet. I was like, Dave, great show, man. Thanks a lot. You know? Yeah. You know, I mean, awesome it, it, show, it, and that was it. Or, or you could be like, "Hey, big yeah. fan, man. You know, big influence." I, mean, I did get a picture with him real nice. quick. I said, "Can I get yeah. a picture with you?" I'll well, like it. I said, I uh, wish I had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was thinking to myself, you know, don't act. You know, just be. You know, you're in. You're in the business. You know, and you you are. And I was, you know, in radio. I'm like, don't 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 be a jackass. Just you know. Yeah. And then you, you can, and, you can, you know, and you can also have, you can do both too, which is like, I'm sure when I met Dave, probably the first things out of my mouth were I'm a huge fan, blah, blah, blah. But then I've gotten that out of my system. Yeah. Move on. You know, and you could tell someone that at the top and then just at that point, treat right. them like a normal person. And it's like, okay, they know that you like their music or you're a fan of their movies or whatever. Well, especially when you're in the room with them, you realize you. it is a person, you know, it's it, at, yeah. at the end of the day, it's a, 
And, and if you want, as a journalist, you know this, like, if you want to really have a good conversation with an artist, at some point you just start talking to them like a person right. and, and don't hold them in such reverence because it's hard for someone to take you seriously when they know that you're you're hanging on every single sure. syllable. At some point, if it's just like you just start talking, people open up way more than if they think that you're like, oh, I write that down. Oh my god, right. I put this on my blog. Hey, hold, let me get a screen cap of us. Fuck all that shit. I dude. know. I th and, and I think Eddie of of all of them, he was probably the most that would just wish people would treat him that way. Right. Well, you know, that's a great segue because um, I was at Eddie's porno party. Uh, yeah, oh, which four. The, no, what was that? Oh. Uh, yeah, oh, around oh four, oh five, something like that. So the story there is that for a brief period, I was the editor of AVN magazine, Adult Video News, and it was sort of like the variety or billboard to the adult industry in that it was a trade publication, essentially aimed at video retailers who have a porn section in their store and need to know like what do i stock my store with you know so this was like listings of all the new releases and interviews with big porn stars and directors and stuff so you could get this overview of the business so it's sort of like working in porn but sort of not really like working in porn i was doing journalism i was just doing journalism with a lot of topless people so i'm at um i did interview dave for avn at one point now that i think about it and um a publicist that I met during that time was uh, Janie. She was work Eddie's future wife. She was a publicist at Digital Playground. And Digital Playground was a company back then. And they were a little more on the artsy, kind of classier, upscale world of porn. But, they, you know, it was porn. Uh, and she was their publicist. And she had set me up with many of their talent to do interviews and stuff for either uh, Pop Smear when I was there or at um, uh, AVN when I was there. And at one point... I think this was actually after I was at AVN as an employee, but I still had all my connections and I knew Janie. Um, Eddie had scored a movie by a artsy porn filmmaker. I think his name was Michael Nin. Uh, Michael right. Nin or one of those guys. Um, but there was these sort of like really artsy porn guys back then. And the somehow seduction not, of... Yeah. Yeah. No, or the such a Gina. That's that's the Valerie Bertinelli movie, isn't it? Oh, you have to have confused. Yeah, if you just look, just look, if you look up Eddie Van Halen digital playground movie, it's the yeah. only one he did. And um, so he did. He scored. I think he just did two pieces of music for it. But he essentially did some scoring for this adult movie, and they threw the um, party, the release party for it at Eddie's house. And because I knew uh, Janie and I knew some other people in that industry. I got on the list to go and I brought my buddy Dino from the street walking cheetahs. And we went to this party where you had to drive into a parking lot at Valley college down the street, leave your car. You were told to leave your cell phone and camera because they didn't want people taking pictures in Eddie's house. We were taken up in these little like trams up Coldwater Canyon to Eddie's place, let in through the gate, let in and told once again, right when the doors were going to open that they would prefer people don't take pictures and stuff. As, and they also said, and we don't know if Eddie's going to be around. He's got a studio. He's got a, he's, it. He might be upstairs. If you don't see Eddie right away, whatever, he'll be down when he wants to be done. The doors open. Eddie's standing right there, shirtless, holding fucking Frankenstein. Wow. Standing in the doorway, playing the most famous guitar in the world. Hey, welcome to my house. And we're just like, oh, my God. My friend, Scotty Slam, great drummer, who happens, was in the same tram as us immediately pulls out his phone and goes, let me get a picture of you guys. Me and Dino stand there and get a picture with me, Dino, and Ed, Eddie Van Halen. You've probably seen that photo. And then I took a picture of Scott, Scotty Slam with uh, Eddie. So we immediately got photos, immediately met Eddie, immediately got to see the guitar. I mean, everything that I hoped would happen in the party happened in the first 30 seconds. Then we walk around. There's food stations everywhere, taco stations everywhere, open bar everywhere, rock stars everywhere, nude porno stars everywhere. The, the pool is filled with naked women. It's fucking bananas. Eddie does an entire set with a house band that night. The word was that Billy Idol was supposed to show up and sing, or at least he was going to sing Rebel Yell. Instead, they did all covers, and then he did it Rebel Yell, but Eddie played all the vocal lines on lead guitar. Based on what I've seen in people that are using and abusing quite a bit, whatever his drug, 
alcohol of choice, whatever his demons were at that time. This was Eddie in the throes of those demons. Don't get me wrong. Nice as hell. Didn't seem high when I saw him or anything. Mm. I'm just saying the overall look was but a I was guy say, who was there must have been himself together. Yeah, and people must have been just concerned for him. Like, I don't know. Okay, He's also or... Eddie Van Halen, though. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, on the other hand, I don't know, man. I mean, there wasn't too, you know, I mean, by the time he got on stage with Frankenstein and started ripping, concern was not the emotion. Yeah, that's, I was, I was yeah, like, ah, that's Eddie. Eddie. <laughs> and he was shredding <laughs> yeah. and he was awesome and he had all the energy. I mean, he didn't, like I said, he, personality wise, music wise, playing wise, you would not have seen any, you know, chinks in the armor, so to speak. Mm. But when, but visually, if you saw him, like as a guy who's seen a lot of people with, you know, substance abuse problems, he was clearly in the throes of whatever his, yeah, but his situation was. Um, so, by the way, Sacred Sin was the movie, and the tracks were Catherine and Rise, right? And Michael go. Nin, you're correct. And I took a lot of photos at that. Um, actually, I was working for G4 TV at the time, which was the video game TV network through NBC. And I went to that party and took and, and told Janie, can I take photos and post them on G4? And she was like, hell yeah. So I took tons of photos and um, and uh, a lot of them, a lot of the party pictures you see from that are either the ones that Janie had professionally shot that she distributed or the ones that I took and G4 posted in super high res, and a lot of people just stole those photos. Yeah. Um, one interesting thing about that was um, the coolest part of that night was Eddie had a grand piano. It's in the room that you see in the Panama video where he's blowing smoke out, you know, yeah. and he's playing piano. So in that room is that piano. Although I, I don't think it was black, though. I don't I feel like there was a white piano in that video. But anyway, yeah, that maybe, might have been not. at like Bert Bacharach's house or something. Wasn't that story? Yeah, or, maybe. Uh, Either way, he was sitting yeah. in a room a lot like that if it wasn't the exact room, but it, it, with a black grand piano. And me and Dino are just standing there with a few random party goers, a couple girls who were, had drank too much and were just bah, 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 gabbing loudly. And Eddie walks in the room pops open the piano and sits down and starts playing to nobody. Just, I mean, just, you know, classical piano off the top of his head, jamming. Me and Dino are like, holy smokes. It's like, like, everyone be quiet. Beethoven is jamming for us right now. Except the two women in front of me, go, oh, I don't know. You know, the thing is about this party. <laughs> Talking at full volume, Eddie stops and looks at them and goes, ladies, uh, I don't often sit down at the piano and play for strangers. You guys are in my house. This is my studio room with the piano. And I don't know, for some reason, I just sort of felt like it. So if you don't mind, I'll continue if you guys want to hear me play a little. But, oh, sure, Eddie. He starts playing. Me and Dino, again, are just going like this. They start talking again, and he goes, ah, fuck it. And he stops, and he storms off. Because these chicks would not stop talking. Oh, my I, God. I did take a photo of him at the piano on my tiny little flip phone. Somewhere I have it, but it's such terrible quality because it was a flip phone from, you know, 2004 or whatever. Um, but anyway, so, yeah, so I did get to see Eddie sit down at the piano and play, and that was pretty spectacular. Wow. Um, and then a few more, right? You got the forum rehearsal story and then the, you yeah, there, there's only show. really, we're kind of wrapping it up as far as yep. my experiences go, but these last two are still pretty good, which is, um, so Van Halen reunites and, you know, there was the press conference that I was at and, um, my brother is an actor, pretty well-known actor named Brecken Meyer. He's in the movie Clueless and, um, I mean, lots of stuff, but Clueless is probably what he's most known for. Travis Birkenstock. He's in Go. He's in the Garfield movies, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, um, at the time, Brecken's best buddy was Tom Morello. And um, Brecken was playing drums in Tom's post-Rage Against the Machine band, The Night Watchman. So around this time, you know, my brother and I are always hanging out and Brecken's hanging out with Tom. And there was another guy that was friends with Tom that I knew from back then named Josh Richmond. Anyways, somehow between those three, because I did not get us on the list for this, but I got invited. One of those guys got four of us, that four, on the list for Van Halen's secret rehearsal show at the Forum, where they rented out the entire Forum 
but only invited 200 people. So it was 200 people in the folding chairs directly in front of the stage and in an empty arena. The only thing besides the empty arena is they had a little Van Halen, um, like a mini blimp. I think they had these at the shows that was flying around with the Van Halen logo. But basically other than this, it was just family and friends. So it was the Burton Alley family and the Van Halen family and Alex's kids and blah, blah, blah. all of whom, by the way, Eddie and Alex's kids all went to Oakwood where me and Dweezil mm. went. Yeah, and Alex's went... son was an athlete. I know he was a yeah. track star. And um, so this is also this the is debut of Wolf right? Yeah, this is 20 yeah. or no, no. 2007. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Right? It's 07. Yeah, 2007. It's 07. Yeah, yeah. This is 07. And so this is also... This moment, this is what's so special about this, besides just the access of seeing them do a rehearsal, is this was the first moment that Eddie and Dave were on stage together again, this rehearsal. And this meaning when they walked out and shook hands, that was the first time we'd seen them on a stage since 1984, right? And they played the entire headlining set in order with, you know, practicing it, essentially. The audience, if it wasn't family, was all rock stars. George Lynch, Zach Wild, all these people. Zach Wild was so wasted that he tried to climb up on stage and Dave had him removed. Like from, they had him thrown story. out. Of the, thrown out. Yeah, it was hilarious. Um, so we got to see that. And that was really cool. And what was really cool about that is that like, I'm standing next to like Tom Morello and George Lynch and Zach Wilde, you know, these guys are fucking heavy hitters themselves. When, when Dave and Eddie walked out, every single one of us was 12 years old. You know what I mean? Like there yeah. were no more rock stars. The rock stars were on stage and all the rest of us were fans. And I've never looked around and seen so many successful established musicians with the look of joy of a of like the, right. the the joy that only a twelve year old kid dreaming of seeing Van Halen could have when that happened like <gasps> it's like it's magic you know what I mean like yeah. I never thought I'd see this happening never, I never thought, thought I'd see never it. you know and here it is yeah. until they walked out I didn't think it would happen sure because by then we that? had that we had the the wool what do they say the the rug pulled out from underneath us yeah, for so long multiple times it's just like oh now they did these songs oh they hate each other again oh maybe they're in the studio nope sammy's back maybe they're gonna nope gary sharon it's like fuck anyway so the only other real uh story i have uh to cap this off with this is sort of the most recent one is um as you know there was an attempt to do a one-off eat em and smile reunion show with all the original members and the reason it, it was at a, a bowling alley uh, or like a venue that also had bowling alley and they used to do these weekly sort of like big jam nights it had a stage at a bowling alley you know it was like a club in in hollywood and um they would have these all-star jam there's jam nights there um lots of celebrities and stuff would turn up so this was on and, and occasionally you might even get a band would show up and do like a mini set at these sort of celebrity nights you know there's a hollywood mainstay to have celebrity jam nights and stuff so this is where this one was going on at the time. And word on the street was that all four members of the DLR or the David Lee Roth band from Eden Smile were going to play the album top to bottom. There was also a rumor that Ralph from Atomic Punks was also going to be on stage in some capacity, maybe doing a duet with Dave. I'm not really sure why you would need Ralph if you had Dave, but that but he was there and that's what we were being told. And my friend Lindsay, again, pork chops and applesauce, Yahoo, uh, launch my old pal um she was still the music editor at yahoo so she got us like tickets and she got us in this thing was packed we got in and because she's kind of small and i'm kind of small we managed to squirm our way to the front in that like it's a stage there was standing room only but at this point i think people might have been sitting down or no, I don't know. We were just all standing in front of the stage, but like the, the stage was kind of right here. And then there was a curtain right here. So all you had to do is kind of look down and you could see on stage Vi's guitars, Billy's bass, the bottom of the drums. It was like, oh, yeah. fuck, this is ha like this is happening. Like, there's Vi's so guitar. So psyched. So wow. We're, but we're that close that like we're front row, essentially. Uh, except they weren't rows, it was standing room only. And John Five opened up and did an instrumental set, which makes sense because he's got a connection to Dave. And then lights, you know, go down again. Curtain goes. They set up the bras, you know, all, I'm seeing the guitars and all that stuff. 
and we see the feet of what look like four musicians walk on stage. Then we see the feet of what look like about 10 cops walk on stage. And then there's a long pause. And then we see all feet leave. And then we see instruments start to disappear. And then someone walks out and says, show's canceled. Fire marshal says we've hit capacity. And they canceled the whole thing on the spot and kicked us all out. Oh, my Isn't God. Crazy? I mean, that that's that, and, and nothing's they must have rehearsed. Since? They must have rehearsed. Like, you don't nothing... pull it. I mean, that shit's challenging. So, like, meaning they must have that week done a few rehearsals. Like, they were ready to go, all geared up to do the whole album top to bottom, is what I heard. What do you think that would have led to? That might have led to some kind of reunion tour. I wish Maybe. that they, I was hoping that, and I kind of was, you know, my first thought was like, well, boys, if you're already rehearsed, you could go any venue in LA, I'll have you. You know what I mean? There was a million venues in Hollywood. Like, why not just go do that show the next night at uh, the Whiskey or something? I'm sure any club would have canceled their normal show and, you know, put the David Lee Roth Band reunion on. So I was always sort of baffled. Not so. Look, in Hollywood, unfortunately, shit getting shut down by the fire marshals is not an unusual story. But to have four musicians of that caliber rehearsed and ready to go, why they just didn't do, pick it up somewhere else that weekend, even if it was right. just some unknown bar show. Like, you got Steve Vai, you got them all there. Everyone knows the songs again. Let's do it. But Such a knows? bummer that it never happened. The Such funny thing about that is uh, I got there. I was waiting for Lindsay. I'm standing outside, and I see a limo pull up, and I see... Uh, Dave walk out of the limo and immediately, and I was just happened to be standing there. I was not waiting for Dave. Oh, I was no. waiting for my friend, Lindsay. Well, I got it, but like a milder version, he immediately got surrounded by fans and I'm kind of back against the wall over here. And everyone that was back against the wall, when Dave got out of the limo rushed Dave. And so he's surrounded by people and he's walking towards the door that I'm standing next to, but I'm not approaching him. Everyone else is. And so he's like, oh, yeah, man, thank you so much. Yeah. And then out of the corner of his eye, he sees me and he just goes, Frank Meyer. Ah. <laughs> and he does it and he walks through anyway. <laughs> I didn't get the big one. I didn't yeah. get the Frank Meyer, but I did get the like Frank Meyer. And then he just kept going. I was like, all right, well, that's pretty cool. Well, do you, <laughs> do you think there will be another moment in the future where you'll hear another Frank Meyer? I don't know. I mean, you know, I've thought, many times about revisiting the book idea um it certainly is not one that would you know be a, a heavy lift to go do um i don't know why i guess just somehow or another i haven't really ever since since the stories i just told you uh you know to be honest i've kind of been involved in my own stuff you know I've, i'm a filmmaker now i've directed three movies i've i tour in three different bands with three different record deals um, you know, I, uh, do a lot of directing of music videos and, you know, at some point journalism and, you know, to some extent kind of telling my story from a fan point of view just became less interesting to me than making my own art and telling my own stories. Um, don't get me wrong. You know, one of the reasons why I wanted to do this was to like, Hey, let me put it on the record in the right order, you know, with someone holding me accountable and keeping me on track. This is it. Um, this is it. Um, so it's not like I'm not someone who likes to look backwards, but I would say for the most part, I tend to look forward. And, you know, at some point, the idea of telling other people's stories became less interesting than where my story was going for me with my art and my music. And luckily, it's my whole story has woven in and out of David Lee Roth and the Van Halen saga. So it's kind of awesome. And, and, and Dweezil was a big part of that. And I, you know, I'm, we're still friends and I have a lot of gratitude towards, you know, those gifts that, that Dweezil gave me. I mean, he taught me how to play guitar. I mean, think about that. He, he hand taught me how to play guitar. Uh, he introduced me to his heroes. He allowed me access to his, you know, his genius father that a lot of people wouldn't get. Um, later on in life, Amit, his brother and I became very, very close. Amit was at my wedding. Um, Amit and I went on the Kiss Cruise last year together and had one of the greatest times I've ever had in my life. 
Um, Amit has become a really good friend of mine over the years. And I've known him longer than Dweezil, but it's like, these guys have been in my life for so long. It's like, it ebbs and flows. Like first half of my life, me and Dweezil, thick as thieves. Second half of my life, me and Amit, thick as thieves, you know, their sister, Diva, Moon. I've known them since I was a baby. So it's like, you know, it's, it's family. That's great. Um, so, I mean, thanks to that, you know, which is just sort of luck of the draw, you know, I got all this access to these amazing artists and, and, was able to see and do these incredible things. Um, so I guess if anything, I'm just kind of happy um, that I got to be there. You know? Yeah, man. Thanks so much for sharing all these stories with us, because like you say, the, there's bits and pieces out there, but just to get it all in one, one well, it's a long interview, so I don't know. You might have to divide this up into multiple Maybe. parts. I'll let you deal with that. You, you can be the editor. I'll just be the artist here. Tell the story. Uh, you, figure out. <laughs> you know, I can see the headline in my head though. Going crazy with Dave's stories from Frank there you Meyer, go. you know? There you go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just I mean, so many. I, you know, hopefully to answer your question, I would love to run into Dave once again, whether we, whether it's because we work on something, whether it's because I interview him or whether or just it's to just say hello, what's up? Yeah, I just yeah. happen to be at the spot that he's at and I'm sure I would get uh, Frank Meyer and Frank Meyer. we'd sit there and chit chat and, you know, he was always a cool guy. So I'm, I'm happy that I got to spend the time with him that I did. I always just try to look at it instead of being... <laughs> Like, oh, I wish I'd gotten to write that book or I wish I'd this, but you know, I have that barbecue on my wedding day. I, I, I just sort of look at it as like, yeah, but look what you got. Like you got yeah. so, you're like your all time hero at some point in your life, like kind of considered you part of his inner circle and let you in. And well, that's what's access, really that, interesting. You know? Cause a lot of people always wonder what's, what is Dave really like? And we get to, we get to know the, the more human side of Dave through you, you know, the guy that, that remembers the people that he meets and he's cool with people that he knows and you know there's that side of him that a lot of people don't know about and you know he's he's a cool dude at the end yeah. of the day you know you know he's he understands if you do something for him he'll do something for you it's it's you know yep. it's a and nice also you, working relationship that you have there but a friendship that developed and, and, and my experience you know just at least through what I understand through Dweezil is Eddie had a lot of those same uh, traits in the sense yep. that like Eddie and Dweezil were friends for, you know, 30, 40 years. I mean, basically when Eddie met, uh, do you, do you know the story about when Eddie showed up to our school and brought uh, yeah. Dweezil that guitar? Yeah. Oh so yeah. That, that's pretty well publicized. That's a that's great story. A, yeah. And I mean, when you think about that, like, yeah, okay. He was Frank Zappa's son and stuff, but he showed up to his school. He had to have known that was making a, humongous impression to a bunch of little kids he gifted eddie a guitar i mean dweezil a guitar in front of all of his friends and then produced his first single and then stayed friends with him up until the day he died i mean that's another guy where it's like you know for all the the you hear about eddie van halen you know we were talking about the dark period at one point and you know he's supposed to very much be a loner and he wasn't really like a hollywood guy but what he was at least my reports for the people i knew is a super good friend that was really dedicated and really loved the people he was, was with and would go out of his way to make sure they understood that he loved them and like that's kind of awesome especially for someone you know, as um, not just famous, but as um, as talented. I mean, to be, I don't know, to me, Eddie's like Beethoven. Like yeah. I, I, Eddie and Frank Zappa, to me, both those guys are not just guitar players. They're not just popular musicians. They're not just composers. They're the likes of which you only get like once every, you know, hundred or two years. Like they're, they were thinking and operating musically on such a totally different level than 99.99999% of musicians in any field. So the fact that like I actually got to meet both these guys and that they turned out to be really nice, genuine people, same with Dave, is like kind of amazing. Because I've met a lot of other rock stars that are not so nice and not so genuine, by the way. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That says a lot about those two guys. And that's the kind of stories we want to hear. So, Frank, let's let's finish up by plug what you got. Oh, I know you got a documentary on uh, freestyle hip hop, yeah. right? The history well, of... Um, history of freestyle rap i mean it's yeah. funny because it, obviously you can tell what a hard rock metal guitar playing type of dude i am but i also got very interested in hip-hop in the early 90s when uh they call it the golden age of hip-hop and um you know so when i first heard nwa and ice cube and all the public enemy i just became absolutely obsessed with it and when i started working at nbc and um i worked at nbc for about 11 years I was a producer, but I became a director and a writer there. I started a podcast 
And that podcast was called Freestyle 101. And I would have rappers come on and basically use freestyling as a conversation piece. Cause I knew most, not every rapper freestyled, but you know, it's sort of like not every guitar player jams, but you could ask every guitar player, like, so tell me the first time you jam. Like, oh, well, shit, I got a great story about that. You know, first time, I, blah, blah, blah. Now, they, maybe they didn't become a jammy type player, but everyone understands that language. So I kind of was using freestyling as a jumping off point with rappers. To like, tell me about the first time you ever rhymed. Tell me about your first freestyle. First time a kid at the lunch table threatened you with the rhyme and you had to, you know, get back and spar with them. And so I would get them to talk about that in whatever way made sense for what they do on the mic and also rap freestyle if they could, if not just rap, whatever, but improv it, you know, meaning like one take. So I did that and I started getting a lot of really big rappers and a lot of bigger rappers. Now all of a sudden I had Ice-T in the game and Wu-Tang Clan and Fat Joe and MLP and Mob Deep and Dell and all these huge rappers. And I was winning awards and they flew me out to New York and I was shooting it out in New York. And uh, two things came out of that is that one, my friend from Hellraiser, from Sons of Man, the Wu-Tang Clan offshoot that was signed to Red Ant, I told you about earlier, he came on the show and then shortly afterwards had a brain aneurysm and lost the whole left side of his body. So I followed him around for the next eight years as he went through real rehabilitation. And I made a movie about that called Risen, the story of Shran Hellraiser Smith. So the first movie I ever worked on is I produced uh, the documentary on the heavy metal artist Thor. That was I Am Thor. Then I directed my debut feature, uh, Risen, which is about the Wu-Tang Clan rapper and the brain aneurysm. And then when we had to sort of negotiate the rights back to a lot of the freestyle stuff because NBC owned it because it was shot for G4 and then they got rid of G4 and then they owned it and they didn't want to do anything with it. So I had to go through years of getting that footage back, but I knew the footage was amazing. Um, I got it all back and then I followed some newer rappers and basically made a movie that, you know, is sort of steeped in that footage originally that I shot, but it's basically the history of freestyle rap and what it means now, because you follow a couple younger rappers that are influenced by all that stuff and sort of see like, kind of like being a guitar player, like, okay, in 1981, if you could shred like Eddie Van Halen, you'd probably get a record deal. In 2024, if you shred like Eddie Van Halen, no one cares. Maybe if you're smart, you get Instagram or YouTube hits. No one's signing you to a label because you can shred on guitar. That Those days are over. If you write great songs, great hooks, different story. But no one cares inherently if you're an expert musician anymore in terms of getting a major record deal. Um, in the world of hip hop, it's very similar. Back in the day, you actually had to be a good rapper to get a record deal. And if you were a killer rapper in that era, you would get a record deal. Now, being a killer rapper has nothing to do with even being a rapper. Most rappers now aren't even good rappers, and they'll tell you, I'm not a rapper. I, you know, I'm a pop star. I play, I do hip hop, but I'm a pop star. So part of the movie is sort of like, okay, if you're Eddie Van Halen on the microphone now, what does it mean? You're the best freestyle champion in the world. You can slice and dice Eddie competitor. What do you do? So that's kind of the movies, like the history of freestyle rap. And then like, OK, now you're this expert and you're technician, but you're in the modern music area and you're a younger artist. What do you do with it? Uh, so, yeah. So uh, that movie's out now. It's on uh, Amazon Prime and Google Play, YouTube movies, all the streaming services it's called Freestyle 101 Hip Hop History. It's got everyone in it. And um, so that's what I've been promoting on the movie tip. And then music wise, I leave on Friday with my sleaze metal band, Trading Aces, where we do a cover of In a Simple Rhyme. In fact, how funny is this? I never thought about this until just now. My metal band, I started with the express idea of going over to Europe on a more regular basis, but not having to fly five Americans over to do it. I was like, well, what if I started a band based in Europe with a bunch of heavy hitters and I'm the only American that needs to fly over? Then I could tour there all the time. And that's what we've been doing. Wow. That's what, that's what I'm doing on Friday. On that record, the band is Trading Aces. The album is Rock and Roll Homicide. There are two covers on it. A Frank Zappa song and a Van Halen song. Nice. Isn't that funny? I never thought about that. Like the fact that I was just telling you, like those are the two rockers that had so much yep. weight in my life. I, we did Dur yeah. Dirty Love by Zappa and In a Simple Rhyme by Van Halen. They're bonus tracks. Um, 
But anyway, the record came out. We're touring Europe yet again. And then my American band, the Streetwalking Cheetahs, are gearing up to also tour Europe in 2024. And we've got a new album and a new single coming out uh, just around the corner. So that's, uh, you know, I play the rock and roll and uh, I make movies about music. And if I'm lucky, I get to hang out with people like uh, David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen. TheFrankMeyer.com, right? The yeah. Website. If you yeah. go to TheFrankMeyer.com, you can go to TheFrankMeyerDirector.com to check out my uh, directing stuff. Um, but TheFrankMeyer.com is kind of everything, my music, my books, everything. And then um, on social media, it's just TheFrankMeyer. Cool, man. Well, I'm such a fan of all your work, your writing, your documentaries, your stories, <laughs> are just amazing it's like where That's haven't right. you been who don't you know you know there's more stories to come my friend one time called me the forest gump of rock which <laughs> yes I, which i wasn't sure how to take that because for, <laughs> for a few reasons being called forest gump is not necessarily complimentary but i know, know what, what he means. meant and and i think what he essentially meant is like somehow all the you know throughout all the years like oh they, they, look at the back of that picture there's frank Meyer. yes you, know? you just find yourself you you land in a in an opportunity, you know, with an opportunity to, to experience something that so few have. And that's what it's great. And you got the stories to tell. So we love the stories. Keep them coming, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.